Welcome, I'm Ryan Holger with TEC. Our topic today is indoor air quality related to residential systems. I know a couple of you were on the commercial one last week and there will be a little bit of overlap as some of the technologies do work the same, but we're gonna look at them from a different perspective, from the residential perspective. Plus we have a ton of other stuff that we're gonna talk about that we didn't discuss on the residential side because it didn't apply at all. So here's our, uh, here's our general lineup. And I, I was going to make this like a 90 minute webinar because I think that's a good amount of time. And I'm like, nah, I always go over my time. So I'm going to go ahead and schedule it for two hours. And then I went ahead and prepared like three and a half hours worth of material. So I had to cut a bunch of stuff out. Um, so the point of that is if you have any questions you want to ask, just ask them because I'm, I'm good with going off tangent and I probably have some, a hidden slide or something we can use to explain it. So if you have any questions, just type them in that question box and I'll read them out and we'll get them answered the best that I can. And if I can't answer them, then I will uh, I will hunt down someone who can. A lot of these products here at TEC are supported by our HVAC Solutions Division, and those guys have a lot of uh, good details and, and stuff they can add to the conversation as we need them. All right, so we're going to go through a little brief summary of IAQ pollutants just so everybody's on the same page, probably stuff you've heard before, but just so we're all together. We're talking about the way the homeowners were thinking pre and then now post COVID because the mentality is definitely different. Uh, we'll talk about filtration and how all of that works. We'll talk about filters that do more than just filter. Well, then we'll talk about all of the different technologies that are not filters that can help us with indoor air quality and specifically with viruses, bacteria, and mold. And then we're going to wrap it up with some other solutions. Um, there's some really interesting stuff that I want you guys to see towards the end there. And I, yes, I'm just baiting you to stay the whole time, uh, but there is some definite information that you're gonna find extremely useful for residential air quality and specifically related to this COVID situation. All right, so let's get into this. Um, I'm gonna power through the beginning just because I wanna to get to all the fun stuff later. So the stuff that's in the air that we don't want, the bad stuff, we drop that into three different buckets, particulates, microbials, and gases. The particulate section of the discussion has three buckets of its own, dust, dander, and pollen. Dust, if you didn't know, is pretty much mostly human skin cells flaking off your body. Dander is what's shedding off of your pets and pollen is what's coming off of the plants. Uh, different people have different allergies related to some of these things, so they can be more problematic than others. Um, if you're not allergic to any of this stuff, then you probably don't care as much. Uh, dust is typically a visual problem. People don't like seeing the dust on stuff, uh, but then the dander and pollen typically is allergic reaction related. And then there's other particles that could be floating in the air as well that could be more harmful to your body. And we'll dive into a little bit of that. Uh, every single day, the average person sucks in about two full tablespoons of particulate matter, which is absolutely disgusting. Uh, if you don't have a good filtration system, which obviously we're going to talk about today, then that means your lungs are the filtration system that's catching all this stuff. I'd rather have something else deal with it instead of my lungs, if that's my choices. That second bucket of stuff is microbials. These are the living things. Right, so these particulates were pretty much dead stuff. Microbials are alive uh, and they're very, very small and we'll dive into that. And they happen to have three buckets of their own. There's bacteria, viruses, and mold spores. Now for bacteria and mold, there are good versions of bacteria and good versions of mold, right? Like there's bacteria in your stomach breaking down food and stuff like that. We're not talking about that. We're talking about the bacteria that's harmful to people that could be in the space. And then mold, there's obviously good mold like uh, penicillin is made from mold. Um, in my mind, a mushroom, a fungus, is basically mold, even though it's not, right? Uh, blue cheese, that kind of stuff. We're not talking about that either. We're talking about the mold that causes people to have allergic reactions and health issues and respiratory issues. So we're looking at the bad bacteria and the bad, bad mold. And then viruses, all viruses are not good for us. Uh, by definition, they're parasitic and they don't serve any other purpose other than to reproduce themselves on your dime. Um, but usually we're focused on influenza and the common cold being the two big ones. And every once in a while, we would hear something about like the norovirus, the Norwalk virus, you know, like you have on the cruise ships every once in a while. And then an avian bird flu or an H1N1 or a SARS would pop up. And, you know, I would kind of leave it at that and not say any more. But sometimes, like in the case of this COVID one, uh, it becomes a more serious matter. And now all of a sudden it is a target for us on the HVAC side to find ways to deal with. So we're gonna to try to find ways to get rid of all of these bad guys, viruses, bacteria, and mold. I wanna point out that mold uh, is usually not an HVAC problem. Sometimes it is, but usually it's not. 
for mold to grow, you have to have three things. You have to have mold spores, and there's millions of them in the air all around you, so they're hard to deal with. Uh, you have to have a food source, which is pretty much anything organic, which most of your house is made out of, wood, uh, paper that's built into your drywall, uh, anything like that it can eat. So that's kind of hard to get rid of all of that unless you're going to live in a stainless steel uh, prison. And then the third thing is water. It needs water to grow. So that's the one we typically target. Now, in the case of this picture, which is the grossest picture I could Google, the whole entire ceiling is obviously covered in mold. But then you can kind of see it almost like flowing down to the door jam there. That tells me that it's probably following the path of water flow, which means it's probably not an HVAC issue. Unless, of course, you have a boiler system and one of the pipes is leaking. But it could be a roof leak. It could be a plumbing leak. It could be a hydronic piping leak. There's a source of water that shouldn't be there, essentially. Now, sometimes you'll see the mold everywhere. It'll just be on surfaces, on counters, on, on cardboard boxes stored in the basement, things like that. In those cases, it's probably getting the water from the moisture in the air. Now, it might be an HVAC problem, and we're going to have to deal with that. And we'll talk about that later on. Uh, deal with the moisture because it affects more than just the mold stuff. Um, some of these things uh, reproduce really quickly. Some of these microbials, uh, it only takes minutes for bacteria to double their head count, right? And hours for funguses and, and mold uh, to grow, to, to, to replicate. Uh, so these things grow very quickly. We want to find ways to get rid of them, obviously, right? We don't want the leaky pipe that's causing the mold. And then we want to have stuff that's continuously breaking them down and inactivating them so they don't continue to become a problem for the ones that are there. Because we're never going to get rid of all of them, but we need to, to, to continuously try to get rid of them, um, at least the majority of these guys. That third category stuff is gases. Uh, that only breaks down into two buckets of bad gases. I wish it broke into three because then we'd have this nice 333 pattern, which I'm OCD, so that would help me. Uh, but one of these things is VOCs, volatile organic compounds. These are in lots of places in your life. Uh, they're in the in the adhesives uh, used to press your 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 plywood desk together, uh, duct sealants, paints, cleaners, all kinds of stuff like that. You can buy low and no VOC products, uh, but it is a challenge. They're fairly expensive, and it's hard to find them for every single thing in your life. But, but they can be found. Um, we can also try to get rid of the VOCs with some of the technologies that we're going to use today. And then we have odors. Odors are not harmful to you. They just don't smell pleasant, right? So if you have to smell some odor coming from your bathroom or whatever, you're not going to die because of that. But it's kind of gross and you don't really want to smell it, right? If you live in an apartment and you always smell your neighbor's food when they're cooking, maybe you don't like that, right? Or if you're in an office building and the person at the next desk has a weird cologne, right? Those kind of things. So we'd like to try to neutralize some of these odors at the same time we're getting rid of other gases like these VOCs that can cause headaches and nausea and other problems like that. From the homeowner's perspective, and this is pre-COVID, this data, I'm going to share it with you anyway. Um, as you might expect, women are more likely than men to buy air purifiers because men are invincible and we're never going to die, so why do we need pure air, right? Same thing with age. Young people, uh, under 30, under 35 even, are less likely to buy an air purifier because for the same reason, right? You're invincible, nothing can go wrong. Now, that doesn't mean they won't buy it. You see there's seven, seven, nine percent of those people are interested in, or are not interested, actually do buy air purifiers. Um, so they will buy them, you should offer them to them. But your real sweet spot targets are the middle-aged folks, for 35 to 65 in age. That's that's really the big target. Those people have a little bit more money to spend than the new people that are right out of, right out of school. Uh, and they typically have researched some of this stuff a little bit better. And more importantly, they're more likely to own a home. Whereas if you're renting, you might not be interested in investing in the house uh, if you're not going to be there in two years. Oddly, that down in the bottom box over there, people with kids are actually less likely to purchase an air purifier. I couldn't find any details or data on why that is. There's multiple studies that state that. But why people with children are less likely baffles me. Because it would seem to me that, oh, you got kids and you want to protect them, you know, your motherly and fatherly instincts. But for some reason, people without kids are more likely to buy these things. So don't stereotype people just because they don't have kids and just because they're a 32-year-old single male doesn't mean he's not going to be interested in this. At this point in time, especially this year, you should be offering it to every homeowner that you come in, into, into contact with. Because uh, at this point, literally more than half of them are going to buy it. Um, I'm going to skip some of these in the interest of time, but there's lots of people that have allergies, lots of people that have asthma. These trends have been continuing and continuing and continuing. I don't remember as a kid 
all my friends being allergic to absolutely everything. In fact, it was rare if you had an allergy to anything. I don't know if that's because people are different now or if it's because we didn't know people were allergic in the past, but it's definitely on the conscience of many folks uh, to pay attention to their kids' allergies and asthma and other related things. Eight out of every 10 homes have at least two indoor air quality problems. Not one opportunity for you, but at least two. And you can see there, basically 40 or I think it's 41% of them have three indoor air quality issues with their home that need to be addressed. Pretty much everybody is a target for you if you're the kind of person that's trying to offer solutions to these problems. Some of the common ones, uh, and we're good in our industry at dealing with some of these, we're pretty good at dealing with carbon monoxide, right? Because if we didn't, with our furnaces and water heaters and boilers, if we didn't deal with it, people would, would die. So we're pretty good at that. And we're pretty good at temperature control, although some of us kind of lack. But in general, our industry, HVAC, is good at temperature control. The opportunities for improvement are with the humidity. And now we're not bad with adding humidity. We're pretty good with humidifiers. But dehumidification, we stink as an industry. We're absolutely horrid. Um, and we'll talk about that at the end today. Uh, the VOCs we could definitely help out with. And particulate matter is a big issue that we can deal with in our industry. And a lot of that will be solved with filtration as well as some of these other technologies I'm going to help you with today. Um, but that's a big, big target is getting rid of these little tiny things that are getting stuck in your lungs. All right. Uh, last couple of things, and we'll move out of the, you know, the salesy type stuff and talk about technology. But people are buying portable solutions. Now, this is 2013 data, and I bet if this study was done again, it's probably even higher this year. because People are buying literally everything off the shelf. Like, you can't find a portable humidifier at Walmart right now. Like, it's non-existent. People are buying these portable humidifiers, dehumidifiers, and air purifiers. Well, why the hell are they buying portable ones? There's only a couple of reasons why they would. One, they don't know they can get it from you. They don't know it's an HVAC thing. They don't associate you with air quality. That's odd, I know, because we pride ourselves on that, but that's not the way homeowners think. If I ask some of my friends how they would clean their air, the last thing they would say is call my heating guy. They would never think to say that. And they probably wouldn't say the same say that about dehumidifying their air. Humidifying, maybe they would, right? So they're either buying it portable because they don't know they can get it from you, or they know they can get it from you, but they think it's gonna be ridiculously expensive. So what do we do about those two problems? One, we have to do a better job as an industry, whether we're the, the comfort advisors or the service techs or the CSRs on the phone. We gotta do a better job as, as an industry of offering these things, especially this year. And then two, we have to offer it as part of our financing packages. Because if you tell someone it's gonna cost them, I don't even know, like $900 for a humidifier, or they can go get one for a hundred bucks off the shelf at Walgreens, eh, it's gonna be a hard decision for them. So you gotta find a way to, to either bundle it in with your, with your furnace and AC packages, or you have to find a way to include it with your financing deal so they can pay for it monthly. Your sales proposition to them is basically, do you enjoy filling your humidifier with water every day? Do you ever forget to fill it with water every day? Do you enjoy dumping your dehumidifier all summer? every single day going down in the basement and dumping that thing, right? Those are your, that's your sales pitch to them. I can install it for you and you never have to deal with it again. It's automatic, right? That's your proposition. Last thing, um, folks when surveyed of things they wish they had from an indoor air quality perspective in their house, most people want to reduce dust. Now this was pre COVID also. So maybe the answer would change right now. Maybe virus removal would jump to the top of the list. But viruses and bacteria are pretty good on the list. Two thirds of the people want to get rid of the bacteria and viruses in their homes. They want to deal with the allergens. They want to get rid of the mold, right? They want to get rid of their pet dander. There's a lot of people I know that are allergic to cats and they have a cat. Their wife said, we're getting a cat or she already had a cat and that's it. Foot's been put down, right? So the, these things are out there. There's lots of people that want to solve lots of problems. They just don't associate you with being the solution. All right. Uh, I want to, we we're going to talk about some COVID related stuff today uh, at three or four different points in the discussion. Uh, this is the first discussion of it uh, because you probably all saw this article um, in like every single news source and you probably saw it shared on social media and Facebook and Twitter and everything else saying that the air conditioning systems spread COVID-19. In fact, some people I know were even shutting their AC off, which is the stupidest idea that I can even think of to solve this problem. Um, but when a little more research is done on some of these things, because anytime you see a news headline, chances are there's a lot more detail that you're not getting. Um, and this particular uh, one I borrowed, quote unquote borrowed, 
from the ASHRAE uh, Madison chapter when they did a presentation uh, a month and a half ago. They did an excellent job on this. Uh, but they broke down this particular case. This is just one uh, screenshot capture for you of that of that restaurant in, in China that was getting all the bad rap. And the money shot on all of this is their ventilation rate was only 0.75 liters per second. And because I'm not good with metric, we uh, did the math for you. That's 2.1 CFM, not 2 CFM per person, not 2 CFM per square foot, 2 CFM total per person. That's not, excuse me, it is per person. I, I said not, it is per person. Uh, two per person, which is not a very high ventilation rate. Most of the codes have somewhere between seven and a half and 20 CFM per person of ventilation required. So this is a really, really low rate. If you don't have the fresh air to dilute stuff, all these other things we're gonna talk about are gonna be difficult to do. Um, so one of the solutions to solving the problem with COVID and other indoor air quality problems is to bring more fresh air into the building, bring more fresh air into the home. Uh, and that's something we're gonna talk about today, actively ventilating facilities, homes. But we're gonna start with filtration. And I'm gonna do the filtration stuff kind of quick because most of you probably know a lot of this. This is just gonna hopefully be a good refresher for you on how this works, but we need to do this as a primer for some of the other stuff because uh, it does affect how those other things work. So the first thing we gotta realize is some of this stuff is super, super tiny. How tiny is it? I don't know. It's measured in microns. What the hell's a micron? A micron is smaller than any other measurement in my brain, so it's really, really small. The biggest thing on this chart is sand, and I consider sand to be one of the smallest things that I can see, right? So sand is super tiny, and everything on here is smaller than sand. Um, the amount of the size is measured in microns, as I had mentioned. So if I said something is 10 microns, we're basically talking about hair, some pollen, some spores. If it's 100 microns, it's sand. If you want to look at something like a virus, which is obviously the trendy thing to look at right now, it's down in the 0 0.01 and smaller range. Some stuff like gases and odors, really, really tiny. And it's going to be super hard for us to get rid of some of those, especially with filtration, because if I have some a filter that's so good it blocks all the gases, Guess what other gas it blocks? Yeah, air, which I can't have it do. So we're gonna come back to this chart several times today as we talk about different solutions to see kind of where they fit on this, on, this, uh, on this chart. But viruses are significantly smaller than bacteria and mold. So they're gonna be the hardest for us to deal with. We're gonna have to do unique solutions to get those guys out of the space. If you're a little bit more visual, maybe this helps. This right here is a human hair. So here's the width. 40 to 120 microns. So here's the uh, here's that hair range. And some of the things we're dealing with, pollen, fly ash. If I was to put viruses on here, in fact, I could lie to you and tell you that there's a virus right here where my red dot is. And I could put, draw a little arrow, so there's the virus. And that's, that's how small it is. You wouldn't even see it under this magnification level. It's that small, really, really tiny stuff. From a filtration standpoint, we have three technologies available to us. We are gonna completely skip chemical gas phase filtration because that's for industrial processes, so it doesn't apply to our life. We can do mechanical filtration or electronic air filters uh, in residential homes, or we could do a combination of those things. Electronic air filters, like down in the bottom right-hand side here, have definitely fallen out of favor. They were really, really, really popular in the 80s and 90s. Folks wanted them because they didn't have to buy replacement filters, and they could clean them, and they didn't have to put filters in the landfill, and they felt good about that, and all that great stuff. When it comes down to it, when electronic air filters load up, they stop collecting other stuff and they have pretty large passageways on them. So they become useless. They have to stay clean. When they stay clean, they do a great, great job and you get pretty high filtration rate, but you gotta keep them clean. So like every month, you gotta go in there and wipe all those plates off. Uh, maybe every two, three months if your house is you know not that dirty. People didn't like doing that. So people, the industry has evolved back to using pretty much all mechanical filtration. I don't know anybody putting in electronic air filtration. They might be, um, or they may say they are, and then you look at it and you find out, no, it just happens to be a mechanical filter that has a power for another reason, which we'll talk about later. But a pure electronic air cleaner is pretty rare now. Carrie and Brian stopped making theirs. We still have ones from Honeywell and, uh, and April Air. So if you are needing them for replacement purposes or something like that, we can get them for you. Although I'm going to recommend that you use some of these other technologies I'm going to talk about later on. And then we have mechanical filtration, right? Mechanical filters use four different mechanisms to catch stuff. The first one of those is impingement. I'm going to go through these and just kind of explain how they work. So this little blue fiber here, 
That is one fiberglass piece in my fiberglass filter. It's one uh, polymer piece in my plastic filtration media, like those green ones that you rinse off. Whatever it is, it, that's what we're symbolizing there. And then my, my, uh, my pollutant in this case is a little piece of dust as indicated by the orange dot. So he's coming along in the airstream. When he crashes directly into one of those fibers on the filter, he becomes impinged on that fiber. That's how we catch him. Interception is sort of similar. Uh, interception, uh, the particle is held onto the material with van der Waal forces. It's like an inherent attraction that every two objects have to each other, right? Based on their, based on their mass. So in this case, the dust didn't hit head on. He had kind of a glancing, glancing blow. It's kind of like your car uh, uh, grinding along the guardrail of, a, of an on-ramp to the expressway. As you're grinding along, it's going to slow down because of the friction, and then it's going to stop there. That's exactly what's going to happen with these particles that don't hit the fiber head on and they get a glancing blow. There is also straining. This one is super obvious. I probably shouldn't even have to explain it, but you have a, a pot of pasta on the stove. You dump it through the strainer. The water's small enough to fit through the holes. The pasta noodles aren't. Same thing here. The dust is too big to fit through the hole, so it clogs the hole up. Now, by the way, when that does that, the other dust coming behind them then becomes impinged on the, on the dust and fibers that are already there, and the filter does a really, really good job. In fact, the dirtier your filter is, the better the filter is at filtering, right? Now, it becomes pretty poor at moving air, and we need to do both so we can't have filters get too dirty. But the dirtier it gets, the more stuff it typically catches. And then at some point, the pressure drop becomes too much for our mechanical equipment, and we're starving off the airflow, and then we've got to change it. That last mechanism is diffusion. This is the hardest one to explain. I always want to skip it because people get confused by it, but I need to explain this one in order for the other stuff to make sense. So when we have something that's really, really, really small, right? So smaller than dust. In this case, I put, pick the virus as my example because that's, that's the trendy thing to pick right now. Really small stuff like viruses don't care about airflow. Airflow does not affect them. And gravity doesn't affect them either. Right, for gravity to work, there's that attraction between all two things in the world and in the universe, that natural attraction to each other, and it's based on mass. So when I am standing here in my office, the Earth has a lot of mass. I have a little bit of mass. So the Earth is pulling me towards him. And I'm pulling back equally. It's just I don't have enough mass to get the job done. So I fall down to the ground to the Earth. The virus has such a small, small, small mass, the gravitational pull from the Earth is pretty much negligible. Essentially, the virus is as light as air. So it doesn't care about gravity. It doesn't settle on counters where they can be wiped off and cleaned. It doesn't settle on carpets where they can be vacuumed up. They just float around the air doing whatever the hell they want. They also don't care about airflow because they're so tiny, once again, they don't have a lot of surface area to them. So for the airflow to blow into them, kind of like you know wind blowing into a sail, if your sails are down, how much wind is going to move the boat? Pretty minimal. You're going to be pushing against the mast of the boat. Right? When the sails are up, you got all the surface area and the thing moves along. Same thing with the virus. It's so tiny that it doesn't get the breeze of the airflow. So it doesn't really get sucked back into the return duct and back to my filter. Now it's going to make it to the filter eventually just by naturally kind of moving around, but it's not going to be in a controlled manner like other things are going to get caught in the filter like dust. I'm not going to be bringing back large quantities of viruses to the filter. They may happen to float their way into the return on accident, irregardless of whether my filter is, my fan is running or not. If they happen to get there, they can get stuck onto the fiber. If they happen to get there and they happen to touch the fiber. So using a filter to catch a virus is, isn't going to happen. Um, I know we can use, you know, HEPA filters, which have the ability to trap a virus because the virus doesn't fit through the hole. It strains on the HEPA filter. That virus would get stuck there. But getting the virus to the HEPA is my issue. So if I can't get that to happen, I'm going to have to do something different. Um, when we look at these filters, uh, they're all rated with what's called the MERV rating. This is ASHRAE 52.2 testing standard. The way that basically works, if you were a filter manufacturer, you'd send your filter in to be tested by a testing lab. What they do is they take air, they run it through a really, really good HEPA to make it pretty darn clean. Then what they do is they, in, they have a, a particle generator, an aerosol generator, and they intentionally inject particles of various sizes into the air. Then they have a particle counter in there to count them to see how many they injected. Then they run it through your filter and then they count the particles again. And if you're able to reduce 99 percentiles of various size particles, that's how you're going to get your MERV rating. 
there are 20 ratings on the MERS scale, one through 20, with one being the small, the worst, or the least ability to catch anything, and 20 being I catch pretty much all things. Um, if the really small stuff, the MERV one, two, three, and fours, you're catching stuff that's really big. You're catching hair and sand kind of stuff. This is the kind of stuff we put in like a construction filter and a rooftop unit, pretty much useless. The original purpose of filters in HVAC equipment were to keep the heat exchange surfaces clean. If I get dirt filled up with my heat exchanger or my evaporator coil, it reduces my heat transfer, which is undesirable, obviously. So we originally put it on there to keep my equipment clean, right? Then more recently, recently meaning the past 30, 40 years, we started also caring about filtering for people air quality. And hence, we got to move up this scale. Things don't get really interesting until you get up to like a MERV 13. That's when I can start catching some of this small stuff. Small stuff in this case being 0.1 to 0.3 microns. But what is that? Well, if we go back here, that's right in this range here to the right of my red dot. Hopefully you guys can see the red dot. Right. So now I am catching mold, I am catching bacteria, hair, sand, pollen, spores, asbestos if you have it, dust. I'm catching that kind of stuff. Still not really doing squat with the viruses, but I'm catching most of the stuff. If you're not going to at least put a MERV-13 in, you're not doing really much of anything. Right? So I know it's been the default standard to use like MERV-8 and MERV-10 on all your new furnace installation projects, and then you'd offer someone a MERV-13 as an option, and you'd offer them a MERV-15 as your best option, your whole good, better, best story. I'm going to advocate to you that now, because of all the COVID stuff that we're talking about, that your entry-level, quote-unquote, good tier begins with MERV-13. And then MERV-15 is, is kind of your, your mid-tier, and then your, your high tier will be a, a really nice filter, a MERV-15 filter, combined with some of the other stuff we're going to talk about today. That's what I'm going to advocate to you to do. And most of you know the good, better, best selling strategy. You offer three options. A lot of people pick the middle option, but some pick the high option, some pick the low option. But I think MERV 13 in this day and age is your entry level discussion point. Filter changes should be done based on pressure drop. No one is going to be measuring pressure drop on their filters. We can't even get people to do it in large commercial air handlers. The only person I know that changes their filter based on pressure drop is me, and I'm a dork. Um, but most people are not going to be doing that. Um, we have lots of ways to do it, right? We can permanently install pressure monitoring systems like we do in, in commercial buildings. We can do it with a manometer, mag gauge, but the chance of somebody doing that is pretty low, but that's the way it should be done. You should not be changing your filters on a monthly schedule. I repeat, you should not be changing your filters on a monthly schedule. The only time you should do that is if you're too lazy or incapable of measuring the pressure drop, then you should change it every month or every three months or something like that. Now, some of our systems, uh, for example, like a carrier infinity furnace or fan coil or a Bryant version of that, um, or some of the other ones uh, like a Heil uh, modulating gas furnace, for example, they have the ability for the control system to automatically track the pressure drop for you and tell you when your filter is dirty. I use that at my house as well. I have an infinity system. It tracks the pressure. I've had it for three years, and I've had to change my filter at 13 months, nine months, and 11 months over those three years, um, which is a pretty long time. That I have a pretty good filter that loads differently than other filters, um, which makes it last longer. But if I was just doing it based on some random timing, I probably would do it every three or six months. But I get to use my filter a pretty long time by using the pressure drop function. Uh, you've probably seen this in air handlers and rooftops. We put the filters in a bank like this. I don't know if anybody realizes why we do that, but we do that to get more surface area and with more surface area, I temporarily slow down the velocity at that little moment in time, right? Because the CFM, cubic feet per minute, uh, divided by the area, feet squared, equals the feet per minute, the velocity. So by having the area be more, with the CFM being the same, I get a little moment as the air goes through the filter assembly of that lower velocity. The lower the velocity, the easier it is to catch this stuff. The higher the velocity, the more velocity pressure I'm going to have, and the more likely it is to push something through and not, quote, unquote, strain it, if you will. Well, on a, on a residential system, I don't have room to put some kind of V-bank uh, filter rack in like this. So sometimes what we'll do is we'll put pleated filters in instead, uh, and that's pretty, pretty useful. So if you see filters that are only like one inch wide, the chance of it having uh, a lot of surface area, if I stretched it out like an accordion, is pretty low. So they're probably not going to be very good filters in terms of slowing the velocity down and hence catching stuff. All of the higher MERV rated filters are going to be like three, four, five inch wide filters. 
to get long pleats in there to give me three, four, five times as much surface area as a regular filter. Regular filters, like I said, are basically good for construction only. Keep keep drywall dust off of my heat exchanger. That's it. Merv four, five, six, and seven. That's crap. Uh, so if you're putting filters in like this for any of your customers, you suck. And I mean that in the nicest way possible. Um, your entry level option should not even be this. This should only be for people that are doing new construction, track homes, and you want to have something in there while they're doing the drywall. Other than that, you should never offer this to anyone. Even a customer with an existing system that already has this filter and they're paying you to change it, which is crazy, they're paying you to change this dinky filter, you should immediately be offering them something better. Uh, and we'll show you different stuff you can offer them. The higher MERV filtration stuff is where we want to be at. Like I said, MERV 13 should kind of be your entry level discussion at this point. Um, many of you have seen the Bryant and the Carrier Easy Flex filters, which are nice because they they fold down to fit in your truck for stock purposes and they expand quickly and you can assemble them in like 10 seconds. Um, many of you use those, but you use the EasyFlex MERV 10. The MERV 13 fits in the exact same rack and uses the exact same end caps. It'd be very easy for you to go to your customers that have MERV 10 EasyFlex filters on a maintenance agreement and offer them a MERV 13 option. Your, your service tech should be able to offer that to them as a, as a quote unquote upsell, if you will. Um, for you guys that don't do carrier and Brian stuff, we have lots of other filters as well. I know half of you guys on the call are using Heil and Day and Night and Weathermaker. If you if you just started using that this month, we just picked up that line, by the way, or Payne. Um, but we also have this one from Respicare. Um, they have a Merv 8 and a Merv 11, which is pretty entry level. Um, but they have some other products that I'm going to talk about a little bit later that will get you up to the Merv 13 that I want to get you to now. Um, but they do have some products like that. And then, of course, we have the stuff from Honeywell and April Air. Um, I'm not going to beat those model numbers and, and, and products to death because we've done so many, or they've done so many webinars this spring. I think you all kind of get what's available there. And we saw all of those if you're interested in those brands as well. Uh, we do do some HEPA stuff. Uh, specifically, we do Life Breath HEPA. Now, if you're going to do HEPA residentially, you have to do it in a side stream fashion. There is no chance that anybody's furnace or fan coil at their house can push enough static through a HEPA filter. These things have like a half inch of pressure drop or more in some cases. You have to do it as a side stream device with its own fan. I am not an advocate of this. If you've been to any of my IQ classes in the past 10 years, you probably know that I'm not a fan of that. I'm not opposed to HEPA filters at all. Uh, it, they're great and we use them in hospitals and clean rooms and stuff like that all the time where we can put in bigger fans and they do a fantastic job at catching small stuff. Um, assuming the small stuff gets its way back to them, which we're going to talk about again. But in a residence, to put it in a side stream fashion and grab 20% of my return air, run it through this HEPA, and then shove it back into the return air, well, that just means 80% of my air is bypassing it, not doing anything. And I guess I could argue that, well, enough cycles around and it'll eventually get there. Yeah, but once again, the small stuff isn't going to get into the return air very often, so I don't want to rely on a bunch of cycles. But if you're really keen on HEPA and, and a lot of... In, a lot of folks are talking about HEPA lately, especially like ASHRAE, and your customer wants HEPA, we have life breath um, HEPA units that mount on the return duct and have their own fan power source, and we can help you do that. It's just that there's a lot better ways to get stuff done. I'd rather have a MERV 15 that has some electrical assistance ability, which we'll explain in a minute, that'll catch as much stuff as a, as a MERV 18 or 19 HEPA and do it with 100% of the air flowing through it. So there's better ways to get this done. Uh, and there's also a thing called Ulpa, which is the which is basically the uh, the top of the line MERV, if you will. It still falls in that same that same bucket, but it's the MERV 20, like the best of the best. It catches 99.999% of the stuff that tries to go through it. Ultra low penetration air, right? It's not something you're going to see residentially, I don't think. I've not seen one anyway, but it is in existence on the chart. So we got all these little small things, and we and we have all these ways to catch them, right? Different kind of filters, electric filter. You know, three inch, four inch pleated filters. I can get you a HEPA. When I say I, I mean somebody can get you a HEPA. I'm not delivering and installing these things. That'll get me down to that 0 0.3, 0 0.2, 0 0.1 sometimes stuff, which would get me to right here on this chart. But what about all the stuff that's smaller, right? Only some viruses, the bigger ones, will get caught in a HEPA, right? And those are like the viruses that are that are trapped in 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 like in like uh, they're like hovering on water molecules. Um, and you probably have heard a bunch of that this spring about a lot of uh, the COVID viruses being in your resp respiration, your breath, where it's trapped 
in the water and hence it makes it bigger and those ones could get into the airstream because they're bigger right and they could get stuck in my hepa but the free flowing ones i'm not catching a, a virus that's not stuck in, in, in a water molecule right so some of these little things what are we going to do how are we going to get these guys right and some of the gases and vocs how are we going to get those guys we need some way to get this really small stuff out of your house or out of someone's house so one of those options is a air purifying filter we have four different ones that we that we that we stock. Um, the Carrier and Bryant ones, as you might expect, are the same technology, just different branding. Right? So most of you probably understand that. Uh, we have Secure Air, which is brand new as of two months ago. Uh, they, they launched maybe at the beginning of the year, and then in Chicago, we launched it two months ago. Uh, so that's a new technology. We'll explain how that works. And then we have a, a solution from Respicare. All of these are MERV 15 devices, and all of these use media filters, and all of these require electrical power. So what they're doing is they're using electricity in different ways, three different technologies here, using electricity in different ways to assist the mechanical filtration. So it's not an electronic air cleaner, it's not a mechanical filter, it's kind of a hybrid of the two. So let's look at this Infinity Evolution one real quick and kind of explain how this works. When air comes in, it goes past this grid that has all these little needles on it. These needles uh, are connected to the electrical source and they're going to do the whole positive negative type thing. And I believe it's going to uh, charge them all negatively. And then the filter itself has metallic material running through it. And that's going to be the other side of the equation. So the negatives will attract to the positives. Uh, each one of these little needles is able to, quote unquote, spark off. You have to keep these needles clean. Um, so every year when you change your filter, you're supposed to wipe them off. Uh, you can do it with a paintbrush or you can do it with like a little packing peanut. That's how I do mine. I just poke each one with a packing peanut and it cleans them off. If they get dusty on the end of it, they don't have the ability to uh, to do as much. Uh, but anyway, we're gonna ionize, which means we're gonna charge these guys. Polarize, which means we're gonna have an opposite charge somewhere to get that electrostatic attraction. And that's how we're gonna cling them onto these filters. If we had a HEPA filter, we wouldn't need to do that because the filter would be so good, right? So tight, that'd be hard for this stuff to flow through it. But in this case, because we wanna have air flow through it easily, we're charging the particles and using electricity to capture them. So it allows us to get a high MERV rate, MERV 15, but have a pressure drop of something more like a MERV 11, 12, or 13. That's kind of the advantage of some of these technologies. Um, so in addition to using the uh, mechanical filtration methods that we talked about, impaction, interception, diffusion, straining, and all of that, we have the electrostatic attraction like we would have on an electronic air cleaner. And then there's a germicidal effect where essentially it electrocutes these germs that are stuck on those fibers. Right? They already got attracted to that other um, metallic surface inside the fibrous material. And then we actually run very high voltage through I think on this one, I want to say it's like 18,000 volts. Uh, it's high voltage, low amperage. So if you touch it with your hand, you're probably not going to die. You're not going to have a good day, but you're probably not going to die. But if you're a single cell organism, it's all it takes. So there's a germicidal effect. You will see the quote unquote capture and kill logo on these kind of products. Um, and specifically this one, the current version of the Evolution and Infinity Air Purifiers has been tested uh, for influenza, uh, strep throat, which is a bacteria, and common cold. Those three it's been tested on. I would imagine they're probably trying to test it on some more, but those three you can you could you know, legally say, hey, it's been tested to kill those guys. Will it kill other stuff? Probably. Can we promise it? No, because we haven't had it tested. By we, I mean Carrier and Bryant, uh, but it's been tested on, on two viruses and one bacteria already. We have another technology uh, from Secure Air. Uh, the Secure Air is kind of a step up to the, to the Carrier and Bryant air purifier. So there are some dealers who are offering like a MERV 13 as their entry level. They're offering a Bryant Evolution MERV 15 as their mid-tier. Then they're offering a Secure Air MERV 15 as their high-tier filtration option. And you got that whole good, better, best thing, right? It, it brings up all of your sales to that mid-tier, which now is the, the Bryant top of the line is now your mid-tier. Plus, you're still going to get 10, 15, 20% that'll buy the secure air option, which is fantastic as well. Secure air is going to be similar to the Bryant and Carrier solution. And by that, I mean it's going to have a media filter, and it's going to have an electrical source, and it's going to fit where a normal filter rack would fit. And it's going to be, you know, three, four inches wide type filters. So it's similar in that regard. But it is going to do something a little bit different. Uh, and actually, I'm going to skip this slide because we've already talked enough about the size. Oops, sorry, about the size of particles. 
the kind of stuff we're trying to get is under one micron, which is difficult to get with a filter, which is why we need this kind of technology to go ahead and get these viruses, which are in red there, um, all viruses, and then most bacteria um, as well are smaller than that one micron. So this is the way that the Secure Air technology works. Now we've been using Secure Air, even though it's only a two, two month old product for us and maybe four or five months old for the industry, it's only new on the residential side. We've had this technology at TEC since 2013 on the commercial side, and it's the exact same technology. It's just a small mini cabinet now, exact same technology. And we've specifically been using it for hospitals and museum type projects. Um, those folks, have lots of need for HEPA filtration. They realize how expensive it is to run fans on these HEPA systems. So they're using technologies like this to reduce the fan energy. Literally we would sell it based on fan energy as compared to a HEPA system. In some cases, we also sell it on the fact that of what it's gonna be able to do beyond what a HEPA can do, which is this right here. So as the air comes through the filter, all of the air particle particles are quote unquote conditioned, meaning that they're going to be charged. Right? So we're gonna positively charge all these particles coming through. As these particles get charged, uh, positive and negatives start attracting and they collide into each other. And sometimes that breaks things apart, but sometimes it, which is fine if it's breaking apart, something hazardous, but mainly what's happening is these things are clinging together, which means they're bigger than they would have been. And once they're bigger, they're more likely to get stuck in the filter. If I have one really tiny thing, or I have seven tiny things all hugging onto each other, well, the seven tiny things hugging to each other based on the polarity attractiveness of them is more likely to get clogged in the filter. The stuff that's still too small to get clogged in the filter goes through the filter with the charge still on it and then goes out into the space where it then can cling on to other stuff that happens to have the opposite charge and make those things bigger. And sometimes those things can be bacteria and viruses and other stuff. Makes them bigger and now guess what? Instead of the virus not caring about gravity, he could fall to the ground where he could be vacuumed up or fall on the counter where he could be wiped up. Or instead of him not caring about airflow, he's bigger and has more surface area and all of a sudden he can get sucked into the return duct and now he'll get stuck into the filter. So that's the big difference with this, they call it active particle control. It's active because it's not waiting for something to come to the filter, waiting for the bad guys to show up and then we catch them. We go out and find the bad guys. That's the difference on this kind of technology. That last one I mentioned was the RespiCare. It's specifically the Ultra Clean 99. I mentioned they had the Pro Clean 90, which is the uh, up to 11 uh, MERV filtration, but then the MERV 15 is the Ultra Clean 99. Um, what it's doing is using a thick media filter like we talked about, and then it has uh, ionizers on there. And we'll talk more about bipolar ionization uh, later on today, so I'm gonna skip that discussion for right now, but he's combining those two te technologies. Um, I don't feel it works as well as the Carrier Bryant and certainly not the Secure Air options, but it works better than other MERV 15 options because once again, it's using electricity in a different technology version, but it's using electricity to aid this process. So I don't have as high of a pressure drop as I would with a straight up MERV 15. Then they also have in the middle here, this MERV 13 option. And this is actually pretty exciting because one of the objections we hear about you dealers offering MERV 13 filters to customers is that either A, you can't fit it on the existing install because the return drop is too close to the furnace and you don't have the time or budget to move it, or B, you just wanna get it done so quickly that you don't want to even bid them moving ductwork around. So the nice thing about this is it's a MERV 13 in a one inch enclosure which is absolutely awesome. So, um, actually, I have one sitting on my desk that I wanted to show you. I don't know if you can see that. Actually, let me show you this too. I found these guys. I was actually cleaning my office um, because, well, it's been slow around here a little bit uh, the past couple of weeks. Uh, now they got all the training caught up. Um, I was cleaning my office from when I moved to this office like three, four years ago. I still had to unpack boxes. So I started unpacking these boxes and I found these little guys, my little buddy, Ricky Bacteria, Jimmy Anthrax, there used to be a virus one. I don't know what happened to him. He's, he's probably in another one of these boxes somewhere. So these dudes are hanging out with me all week, uh, helping me get rid of uh, their buddy. And I'm a dork for even showing you that apparently. Uh, so this is what that filter looks like. This is a small, mini, tiny one. So that way it fits under my camera. You would never buy one that's this dimension. Uh, it's gonna be normal dimensions. Although you could get one this size if you wanted to. Uh, they will custom make the sizes that you want. 
but normally you're getting, you know, 16 wide or 20 wide, 25, like normal sizes like that. In any case, these side clips open up and this guy opens up in here and has this small disposable media in here that you would have to change every three, four, five months typically. It depends on how fast it loads. Once again, use pressure drop if you can, but that's how often you have to change that. Now you're looking at this going, that's no better than those cheap filters you were showing me, Ryan. Yeah, it's not. And it has like no pressure drop, but it also has an electric char charging grid. In this case, it's an ionizing grid. And like I said, we're gonna talk more about ionization technologies later on, but it has that combined with the filter media and that's how we're able to get relatively high filtration with really low pressure drops and only one inch thick. There's also a two inch thick version for commercial. From a power source standpoint, just one of these little tiny plugs on here for low voltage power and you plug it into the outlet. It's super easy to do. So you plug it in the same outlet that has your humidifier, slide it into your existing one inch rack. If you're smart, you just put a little piece of uh, like foam tape on the side. So when you put the door on it, it covers it up. By the way, you guys, with the filter racks, if you're making these homemade ones, you have to put some kind of cover on them. Not putting a cover on there allows so much airflow to bypass around these guys, or, or any filter for that matter. But the better the filter you have, the more air will bypass through a certain size crack. Um, so we gotta do a better job of that. Let me, uh, go back to my slide deck over here. By the way, we've been making this grid here. By we, I mean mostly Sal and John in our office with a little bit of help from me, uh, making this grid to compare some of these products. So I'm gonna show you that at the end too and kind of walk you through that and get it to anybody who wants to have that cheat sheet on how to compare some of these things. Uh, this guy, like I said, uses a bipolar ionizer. Pressure drop is pretty low, uh, under 0.2 inches of pressure drop. It doesn't consume much power, two watts. It's low voltage. It slides in a one inch rack. It's a five year warranty. I don't know why you wouldn't offer this to somebody that has an existing one inch rack. Like it's like a no brainer for all your like maintenance. You should, this is something you would even carry on a truck because you only need like three sizes to fit most filter uh, slots. All right, you guys are really quiet. Nobody's asked any questions yet. We're 45 minutes in. So either I'm super boring or I'm super awesome. I don't know which, um, it's probably boring. Uh, but if you have questions, type them in uh, and I will, uh, I'll read them out and get you guys answered. All right, UV lights. Lots of discussion with UV lights. You see, I have it listed here as UVGI, ultraviolet germicidal irradiation. Uh, you might hear it called UVC because it happens to use the C band. Um, you're hearing a lot about it because it's one of the things that ASHRAE has been recommending to all these buildings to do. Get your ventilation right, put in high uh, MERV filtration filters, put UV lights in. Like, that's the things you've been hearing. And then the reason I recommend those three things is because all those things are like, 70 plus year old technologies that have been around forever. So they feel safe telling everybody to do that. And if you wanna do more stuff, that's fine. But that's kind of the basic that everybody should be doing. All right, we call it UVC because it's the C uh, band of the ultraviolet light spectrum. Typically we're using 254 nanometers, not that anyone cares what we're using, but that's typically what, what we are using. Uh, all the visible light coming from the sun, if you looked at that, uh, UVA, B and C are, are coming through our, into our, to our atmosphere. And some of these travel through glass like A and B, and some do not, ultraviolet C lights. There's the different bands there. The way I like to kind of think about this, um, this ultraviolet light coming through, it's gonna break down the DNA of these small microorganisms. The way I like to envision it is if I go outside on a sunny day like today, and I stand outside for two hours, I'm probably gonna get a sunburn or at least a suntan. In either case, sunburn and suntan means my skin cells are dead or dying, right? Each one of those cells dies when it's exposed to the UV light of the sun for any type of extended period of time. If I artificially generate UV light, it'll also start killing cells. Now, if I'm a single cell organism and, I, and, one, and one of my cells dies, I'm dead because I only had one cell to begin with. In the case of Ryan's skin, my outer layer of skin dies, my under layer of skins do not, right? So this is really good for killing single cell organisms, but it's not gonna kill anything bigger, which is fine because we're only trying to get viruses, bacteria, and mold. And those are basically all in that single cell organism uh, category. But just like with the sun, if I go outside for five minutes, I'm not getting a sunburn. Two hours, sure, five minutes, no. So I need a lot of time under the sun or a lot of time under the UV light to get my skin cells killed. 
The same thing happens with germs, single cell organisms. They need to be in the light for a decent amount of time, or you need to have really intense lights. For example, if I get closer to the sun, I go towards the equator at certain times of year, I'm gonna get sunburned faster than if I go further away from the equator, right? Because I'm farther away from the sun. Same thing here. So the, the, the organism, the closer he is to the light, or the more intense the light is, or the more time I spend in visual contact with the light, that's to determine whether I get killed or not. It can be expressed mathematically. It's called a CT value, but most people just call it the kill dose. The kill dose for each single cell organism is not the same because they have different cell wall structures. So each thing we want to kill, bacteria, virus, mold, whatever, has a different kill dosage required. And there's data that shows you what those are. Those kill doses are expressed in a unit of measure called microwatt seconds per square meter. Don't ask me exactly how the hell that evolved, right? Um, but the UV light bulbs are also rated for microwatts seconds per square meter. So if I know what my UV bulb is putting out and I know what thing I want to kill, I can figure out how long I need to hang out by the light and within a certain distance of the light. The further you get from the light, like the further I get away from the equator, the less it's going to do. This just gives you an example. If I say that one inch away, I'm at full power, but by the time I get eight inches away from the bulb, um, I have a 92% reduction in power. So the closer to the bulb I am, the more stuff is going to get killed. Now, if I'm a germ hanging out on a coil and the UV light shining on the coil, I honestly don't care how long it takes because I'm going to be there for a long time. If I'm a germ moving through the air, now it matters a lot. I'm only going to be there for seconds. Uh, Chun typed a question in. Let me expand it and see. Uh, is OEM brand available of UV light lamps? If it is available, is it a good idea to use OEM light lamp? What do you mean by OEM? Um, are you saying? Are you asking if you can put a put a generic bulb into a specific manufacturer's ballast? I probably wouldn't do that. When you're buying a replacement bulb, I would buy the bulb from the same manufacturer that made the original ballast. Um, Otherwise, you have to try to deal with which ones may or may not be convertible. A lot of them get their lights from the same place, like they'll all get them from like Philips Electronics or something like that, but they may have different connection points. Um, so just get the one that is for your specific model. Trying to get a third party one, I don't even know. I don't even know if anybody has any charts to even help you figure that out. All right, so let's say I, let's say I want to kill some stuff. And I stole this from the Honeywell guys. Uh, one of the Honeywell bulbs, the UV2400, is 600 microwatts per second. Micro Let's just say it's 600, right? The microwatt set, it should be it should be microwatt seconds. That should be separate from the, the T uh, per centimeter squared at 12 inches away. Most of the UV light manufacturers will rate their bulb at 12 inches away because typically they're meant for coil use and typically you're gonna mount them within 12 inches of the coil. Now, how well it's gonna kill it is a function of the feet, feet per minute, the velocity that I'm moving, which is a function of the CFM and the duct size. Okay? So I'm gonna figure all these things out. Here on the chart is showing you the dosage rates needed. I'm gonna blow that up. Let me get my little uh, laser pointer thingy. So on the left here, I, there's various bacteria. On the right, mold, viruses, and a few other things. There's two columns for each one. And once again, this is microwatt seconds per centimeter squared, how much I need. There's a 90% reduction column, meaning 10% survive. There's a 99% reduction, which means 1% survives. And then for some of these items, there's test data available to you to show a 99.9% .9 kill rate. So these are different ones, and we can look at any one of these. Like I say, I take uh, this very first one, this, this bacteria uh, anthrax needs 4,500 to kill 90%. If it's the anthrax spores, it needs 2,400. The spores have uh, thicker cell membranes. If I go look under the virus section, I look at influenza, it needs 3,400 to kill 90%, 6,600 to kill 99%. Just to give you an idea. So let's do some math. Oh, everybody loves math. Yay, math. All right, so I'm going to take a bulb that is 800 microwatt seconds. I forgot the S on there. It should be microwatt seconds per centimeter squared at one foot away. I'm going to do it at a typical 500 feet per minute velocity and at 55 degrees in this example, which is normal cooling temperature. The temperature of the air does have a slight effect on it. It is fairly negligible compared to the bulb and the feet per minute, but yeah, the temperature does matter a little bit. All right, that's what that bulb was rated at. So let's say I want to kill these uh, bacterial subtilis spores. I want to kill 90% of them, meaning 10% survive. I need 11,600. 
I'm gonna divide that by the 800 of the bulb, and that gets me 14.5 seconds. I need to shine on them for 14.5 seconds at one foot away. Let's take influenza. Let's say I wanna kill 99% of influenza. That's 66,000. Now, this is assuming I can even get the virus to the bulb. That's a whole other debate that we just talked about a minute ago. But let's say he does get to the bulb. I need 6,600 to, 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 to kill 99% of them. Divide that by the bulb, 800. I need to shine on them for 8.25 seconds at a distance of one feet. So if I got air moving through my, uh, in my coil at 500 feet per minute, and let's say I don't reduce my duct size and I keep my duct size the same width as the coil size. If I do that, I need to shine on it for eight seconds for 8.25 seconds at one foot away. That means I'm going to need to put a bulb every two feet for 66 feet in order to have that amount of shine time. You probably don't even have 66 feet of duct at most of these houses. So this is not going to work for killing something in the air. You cannot use UV lights to kill germs in the air. Will they kill germs in the air? Yes. But they're going to kill the germs that in the air that come really close to the bulb. The ones that are a foot or more away, nothing's happening to those guys. The ones that are half a foot away, nothing's happening to those guys. Now, if I was a UV light manufacturer, I would say, well, yeah, that's true, Ryan, but you know, those germs are going to come back around for a second, third, fourth, fifth pass, and it's a cumulative effect. That's absolutely true. It is a cumulative effect. Just like if I go outside for 15 minutes, I don't get a sunburn, I come back in, then later on I go out for 15, and then again for 15, and again for 15. I do that a few times a day, I might end up getting a sunburn. In 15 minute increments, I might have enough time total to get the sunburn. Same thing happens here, but once again, I was lucky to get the virus to come through the return duct back near this light bulb up by the coil. The chance of him coming by five, six, seven, eight, ten times, not likely to happen at all with the virus. So you cannot use UV lights to tell people you're going to kill viruses. It's true they kill viruses, but in the application of installing them on a ducted system, it's not really going to kill the ones that we care about, which are the ones in the people's rooms. For example, or one more example, if we want to look at COVID, now he wasn't on his other chart because COVID wasn't tested at the time these charts were made. But I found this particular uh, uh, research study. Um, now it's not a finalized thing, so we can't say for sure this is exactly what it takes, but the way this is on a logarithmic graph. So this means here 10% survived, 90% killed. This one means 99% killed. And this 0.1 means 99.9% .9 killed. And then the dosage that are required here. So if I look at it, let's say I want to kill 99.9% .9 of the COVID that happens to make its way to my UV bulb. I only need 2730. That's not that much compared to the other stuff we just looked at, less than influenza. It's easier to kill than the flu. But even with 2730 and that fairly intensive bulb, I need three and a half seconds. That means I need the bulbs every two feet for a total of 28 feet. That still isn't going to happen. Nobody's going to install that. It's ridiculous. You don't even have the link to do that in a residence. So using these bulbs to kill COVID, unlikely. Uh, I mean, it will kill COVID, um, but it's just that in the application of someone's house, you don't have enough distance to work with. So what is it good for? Why the hell we got these bulbs? It's good for cleaning coils, because coils don't move. Coils are stationary. They're not going anywhere. So if you want to kill the bacteria and mold that grow on your coil, UV lights are fantastic at that. And the drain pan. If you put it on the discharge side of the coil, it'll shine on most of the drain pan as well. Uh, or if it's an A-coil, if you put it on the underneath side on a, on a vertical application, it'll shine on the, on the coil and it'll shine on the drain pan. Uh, so this is, a, this is an easy thing to do to keep coils clean. Well, if it doesn't kill COVID, I don't know if I want to offer it to my customer. Just open up somebody's unit and show them this grossness on the left. You don't even have to tell them what it is. You don't have to know what it is. You don't have to know how it got there. All you have to do is show it to them and say, Mr. Customer, do you know what that is on your coil? And when they say, uh, no, what is that? Say, I have no effing idea. I don't know what that is. It looks so, so gross though. We, we can't have that there. We need to have that cleaned off manually. And then we're gonna put a UV bulb on it to keep it clean. And that stuff won't grow in there. I don't care what it is. It, it shouldn't be there, right? And not only that, it hurts, it hurts heat transfer. It hurts airflow uh, in addition to being gross. Um, where to put the bulbs? On well, a perfect world, we just bathe the whole coil in them. And, and we would love that. If you bought six bulbs for every A coil, we'd be so excited here at TEC. Uh, but you're not going to do that. You're going to buy one or two bulbs. If you buy two bulbs, you put one above and one below. If you put it below, you put it like this one right here. 
and it shines on this coil, that coil, and the drain pan down below, which is great. If you put it above, you need to put it this direction. I should have put a picture on here. You need to put it this direction. If I put it here, most of the light will shine on this, this pan thing on top, which isn't going to do much for the coil. I need to put it up here, reasonably high, and then put it this direction that way so it can shine on both sides of that coil. If you're only going to buy one bulb, I recommend you put it here in the middle of the A-frame because then it does shine on the drain pan and it shines on the side of the coil that is seeing the incoming air, which is where the germs are coming from to begin with. Um, there are lots of studies out there that show you that the more crap growing on your coil, the amount of efficiency you're going to lose in terms of airflow and heat transferability. I'm not going to go through that, just so you know it's there. Uh, and in this study, I believe this one was from the guys over at Sterile Air. I kind of stole it from them. Uh, that's why I got to mention their name, give them a little credit. Um, but this study was showing the same kind of thing happening with the UV lights um, and the ability for it to help with your coil pressure drop, uh, help with your system airflow, uh, help with your discharge temperature off the coil, right? Getting you three degrees better uh, uh, cooling. So instead of, you know, 59 degree discharge, you got 56 degree discharge because you're doing a better job at the heat exchange. And then also allowing you to spend more time at the lower wet bulbs, which dehumidifies. So keeping these coils clean, there is a benefit to doing that. All right, beyond just the UV lights, there are other widgets that have UV bulbs in them. Uh, these ones all happen to be from Respicare. There are other manufacturers of some of these technologies, although the Oxy4 is specific to Respicare. Uh, but the other ones are a little bit more generic, if you will. I'm going to talk about all three of them in one crack here. PCO, Carbon Systems, and Oxy4 Systems. Now, the ones we use residentially are typically these ones that have the LCD on them. And the reason we do that is because most of these in our climate are mounted in the basement and they have a 365 day countdown clock on them. And after 365 days, they beep. So the homeowner hears that. And then there's a, on the screen, it tells them they need to change their bulb and then it tells them who their contractor is. You need to load your name and, and company phone number on there so they know who to call to come up change the bulb. Right? And then you need to train your CSRs when they get that call. Yeah, there's this annoying beeping in my basement by my furnace. You tell them to go down there and look at it, or you look at your records to see that you guys installed it a year ago and tell them, yep, we need to send somebody out to, to change that bulb. When would you like to schedule it? Blah, blah, blah. And then after you get it all scheduled, then you could tell them if it's annoying and you can't sleep or whatever, unplug it. Uh, and we'll, you know, when we come in two days, we'll put the new one in and plug it back in for you. They also make these other style ones that have no LCD on them. That's typically for uh, attics and uh, high heat applications where the LCD wouldn't do so great um, or in places where you never see them. Like commercially, we use those because no one's ever going to see the screen up in the ceiling of the commercial building. And they also make ones that could go inside the air handling equipment um, magnetically uh, if you needed to do that. All right, so the PCO part. PCO stands for photocatalytic oxidation. You can get a PCO device or you can get a PCO device um, with a carbon device. I'll just talk about them together in one swoop here. The photo, the P, um, stands for photo, which means there's light involved. So there is a UV light in there. These are not UV lights. I mean, they are UV light bulbs, but they are not UV lights in terms of their application. Their job is not to shine on coils and kill stuff. If they do, that's a bonus, right? Their job is not to use UV light to shine on germs in the airstream and try to kill them even though they're moving too fast. If they do, that's a bonus. Their job is to use the light as a catalyst to cause a chemical reaction, with this example, titanium dioxide in the case of PCO, uh, to create oxidizers, and then send those oxidizers down in the duct system and into the home to attack stuff. Specifically, we're going to send three oxidizers out to go out there and attack this stuff. So how this is going to work? Yes, there's a UV light in it, and if they put this device next to the coil, uh, the UV light will shine on the coil and help keep it clean. The one I'm showing you up here on the top has a PCO cartridge on the top, has a carbon on the left in black, a carbon on the right in black, and then the bottom is open so the bulb can shine down on the coil if you put it above a coil. If you had a horizontal application, you could take this uh, black carbon guy out, put him on the bottom, and then have the left side here be open so it can shine on the coil that way. So you get a little bit of bonus of it shining on the coil. Right? It's just a little nice extra feature. Um, the PCO part is where it's interesting, and the carbon, excuse me, the carbon part and PCO part. Uh, the carbon part, which are these black cartridges in this case, Carbon's really good at absorbing odors, um, but it needs to be regenerated. In this case, the UV light can regenerate it so it can continuously absorb odors. Right? So you don't have to change those cartridges out. Now, maybe every four or five years, you got to change the cartridge out. But you don't need to do it on any kind of regular basis. 
And then the last part, and it absorbs orders uh, and VOCs, uh, the carbon well, uh, which is great. Um, but then the POC part is that white cartridge on there. And you can also get ones that have all PCO on them and no carbon, that's also an option. Um, but the carbon has titanium dioxide on it. When the light shines on it, it causes a chemical reaction. It creates the oxidizers, like I had mentioned, and these oxidizers go out into the space. So they're primarily hydroxyl radicals. What the hell is that? Well, hydro is hydrogen, oxyl is oxygen. They're not, they're not bad things in and of themselves. Um, the radicals mean that they're unstable. If you flash back to like high school, you know, chemistry or whatever, I'm sure you had great memories there, Bunsen burners and all that. Radicals are unstable things and everything in the universe is pretty much trying to get to an equilibrium state, assuming that it had feelings and it could try to do stuff, right? Everything wants to be balanced and equal, right? High temperature goes to low pressure, high humidity goes to low humidity, high um, pressure goes to low pressure. Everything's trying to get equal out, if you will. Same thing happens to the radicals. If I have an unstable compound, he's gonna bump into and collide to other compounds, and if they're both unstable, they're gonna try to break apart and form into something that is more stable. That's what they're going to do. Um, they have other benefits as well. So in this case, we have a UV light shining on a titanium dioxide plate, like we're talking about, that's that white plate I was talking about. And as the air passes through that guy, it picks up those oxidizers. In this case, we're showing it producing uh, OH oxidizers. O is oxygen, H is hydrogen. These guys have the ability to group together because they're, they're charged and surround stuff. They have the ability to break things down into smaller components. Uh, and they have a byproduct that is typically going to be carbon dioxide and water, which are not harmful to us uh, in, at all. Right? You breathe carbon dioxide and you are made mostly of water. So those are not bad things. Uh, this is some third-party test data. This is not on the Respicare one. This is just one I happen to have on my computer randomly. Um, showing some kill rates on various things for bacteria and viruses. A lot of these manufacturers will just test one or two bacteria, one or two viruses, kind of like the carrier guys did, because uh, it is expensive to test everything. Um, but uh, it does show that they have pretty good kill rates of some of those types of things. The Respicare guys have all that stuff. They have PCO, they have carbon devices, they have combos of PCO and carbon. And then they also have this other thing, which is called Oxy4. Uh, Oxy4 means that there is a fourth oxidizer. Regular PCO has three oxidizers, uh, hydroperoxides, uh, hydroxyls, like I mentioned, and superoxide ions. The Oxy-4 has a fourth oxidizer, which is an oxidizing ion, O3 negative. Uh, so there is an extra killing agent, if you will, an extra scrubbing agent to attack stuff in the space. The nice thing about PCO and Oxy-4 is unlike a filter, which has to wait for the bad thing to come to it, unlike a UV light, which has to wait for a bad thing to come to it, the Oxy-4 and PCO are able to send the oxidizers out into the space and actively attack things in the space. So it's kind of like, kind of similar to what you're doing with the secure air filter, right? Those guys weren't attacking stuff in the space. They were clumping them together and bringing them back to the filter. The Oxy-4 is actually gonna kill stuff in the space. Now we can argue about whether viruses are alive or not. I've been saying kill, uh, and technically viruses are not alive uh, because they can't reproduce on their own. They need a host cell. Um, so maybe we should be saying we can inactivate the virus, um, but I like saying kill because it just sounds more powerful. Um, so I'm going to kill the virus, uh, but the bacteria, mold, viruses can be destroyed and inactivated, killed by these oxidizers. I do want to point out something on these Octi-4 and even the other PCO devices from Respicare specifically, because uh, at first I didn't know this. Uh, I had gotten one and put it in my house, and many of you know that I used to have five cells for like six years in my house. Uh, and was very happy with those. And then I put in an Oxy-4. This would have been like three years ago now. And it wasn't doing much for me. And my measurement scale was whether my kids got each other sick, which never happened with my old technology. But I put this in and people were getting each other sick like a normal family would. And I was like, what the hell? So I called up the lady over at Respicare and I was like debating with her. I'm like, why isn't it working? She's like, well, maybe it's defective. Let me send you a new one, which she did. I had no better results. And I was just like, what the hell, man? And then I saw her at a trade show the one time and I was talking to her about it and I was basically ragging on her. Like, I don't like your product. I don't think it works, blah, blah, blah. And she's like all baffled. And she's giving me all these examples of how great it is everywhere. And I'm like, I hear you, but like in my house, this is what's happening. And she's like, well, did you rotate the clips? And I was like, what? Rotate the clips? She's like, yeah. If you take the cartridges off, the, the, uh, the, uh, the titanium dioxide cartridges off, and then you got to rotate the clips to give you more or less bulb exposure to shine on them. I'm like, what? I didn't know that. She's like, well, it's in the manual. Like, I didn't read the manual. No, I'm lazy. You should have told me that the first three times we talked, right? 
So I immediately went home and mine was like the one on the right over here. It comes with these three clips on it. And what you can do is you can like rotate it so it looks like the one on the left where the two clips are in the middle. So more bulb surface area shines on that titanium dioxide cage. So in my case, I took all the clips off, I just took them all off. At the time I had a commercial 16 inch one. Cause at the, that point I was trying to like really see, I took the one out, put the other one in and that didn't work. So I put a 16 inch one to get more output. And then at this point now, uh, took all these clips off. It's been great since then. I was not getting enough output for how much crap and filth my kids generated apparently, or me, I don't know. Um, if I had a small house, or if it was just me living alone or me and my wife, having these clips block off some of the, of the surface area would be great, because what happens is these oxidizers go into the space, specifically the O3 oxidizer goes into the space, and if it doesn't find something to attack, it just kind of lingers in the space, and then people smell it, and they can say, yeah, there's this weird like metallic smell in my house after you put that device in. So for some people, you need to rotate them and block it off. For other people that have large families and dogs and whatever else going on, you need to rotate them open, or in my case, take them off. So make sure your installers are aware of that. Uh, the opportunity goes beyond people's houses. Um, schools and daycares are big targets right now. Nursing homes are fantastic candidates for this stuff. Uh, Jordan typed the question in, uh, how does Oxy4 compare to Remy Halo? Uh, so we don't use the RGF products anymore. We used to use RGF. In fact, we used to have three different manufacturers of some of these technologies. Uh, of bipolar ionizers, PCO devices, and then the phi cell uh, from RGF. And we consolidated them all. Our solutions group thought it was a better idea to deal with one vendor than three vendors, right? Because multiple small vendors is kind of a hassle. So we have one vendor providing us all of those kinds of technologies. Um, obviously the bipolar ionizers generics, we could replace that directly. The PCO we could replace directly. But then the, uh, the RGF, phi, and Remy products, um, those are competing directly with this Oxy4. This Oxy4 for TEC's purposes is to replace the Remy products that we used to have, the RGF products we used to have. Now, our RGF 5 cell and a Remy have three oxidizers. They have hydroperoxides, superoxide ions, and they have hydroxides. So we have two of the same ones with the Oxy4. And then instead of the hydroxides, we have hydroxyls and oxidizing ions. So I don't know how you decide if one's better or the or the other one's better, um, but it just seems like maybe four is better than three, assuming that, you know, we're gonna count them. Um, but this guy is meant to directly compete with that technology. It's working in a similar fashion, which is we're going out in space and actively attacking stuff. Uh, the last uh, technology that we wanted to talk about as far as these uh, duct-mounted ones, and then we'll get into some of the other cool stuff, is bipolar ionization. Um, I am not a huge fan of bipolar ionization. I'm not saying it doesn't work. I'm just saying I've had really good success with the bulb-based technologies, PCO, Oxy4, and our old friends at the competitor. Um, I've had really good luck with those, and these ionizers, I'm not saying they didn't work, it's just that I didn't have the same kind of customer feedback about how wonderful it is after they're installed. It wasn't like I got bad feedback, it just wasn't wonderful feedback. But I'm gonna explain how they work anyway, because there are some times that you may wanna go this route. So. Up on top is a, is a generic bipolar ionizer. There's, they charge one pole charges things positive, one charges things negative. And I want half the stuff coming in the air to be charged one way, half the other way, and then I want them to positive negatively attract to each other and cling on and become bigger and that whole same kind of story again. So because of that, I need to have the airflow going this direction that I'm showing here with my mouse. I can't have the air going this way because then an air molecule coming in with something on it will be charged positive and then it'll be charged negative and everybody leaving here will be charged negative at that point doesn't make any sense. I need to have it go this way so the guys on the right get charged one way, the guys on the left get charged one way. All right, so the installation is important on these devices. The Respicare one, which they call ion plasma, that guy actually has four needles on there, but the two on the left are negative and the two on the, on the right are positive. And there's little arrows on this guy telling you, yes, the airflow has to go this way for the exact same reason. So they're charging half the stuff positive, half the stuff negative. Um, they're charging the hydrogen and oxygen ions in the air creating this plasma, uh, that's why it's called bipolar, positive, negative, bipolar ionization, which is the hydrogen and oxygen ions, very similar to the bulb products we were talking about before. They create that plasma field, and if something comes through, in this case, ammonia, not that you probably have ammonia at your house, but it's just something to use as an example. If it comes to the plasma field, it's gonna break that apart. And what's gonna happen is those guys could rejoin back together as ammonia, 
which is three parts hydrogen, one part nitrogen, or what's more likely to happen is that they cling on to somebody else because once again, everything's trying to get to more stable compounds in the universe. So the hydrogens could jump on an oxygen, and if you get two hydrogen and oxygen, guess what we have? H2O. If two of those nitrogens glump together, we have N2. That's the nitrogen that we have floating in our atmosphere. It's like 80% of our atmosphere. So the idea is that it breaks something complex down into more simple, more benign things that are favorable to the people in the space. A nice benefit of that is that water vapor is typically one of the byproducts, and water vapor helps us out in the wintertime with some of our things like uh, doorknobs, static shock, and stuff like that. They also have the ability to form these ion clusters, similar to some of the other technologies that we had mentioned, uh, that can attack things like viruses and bacteria because uh, they have those same kind of hydroxyls that are formed with this process. So there is some of the same benefits uh, there in that regard. Um, I didn't mention it earlier, but the hydroxyls, what they're literally doing is they're suffocating the virus. Um, just like you need to have oxygen to breathe, these viruses need to have hydrogen to quote unquote breathe. They're not really breathing, they're not respirating, but they need to have hydrogen to survive and the hydroxyls surround them and starve them off from the hydrogen uh, and then they die. Um, most of these manufacturers of bipolar ionizers have similar test data to everybody else, um, and it shows that kind of stuff. The Respicare one is actually kind of cool uh, compared to some of the generic ones, because the generic ones, you have to go wipe those needles off every few months, very much like you have to go clean the needles on your carrier and Bryant uh, air purifiers. You got to go clean the needles on a bipolar ionizer. But the Respicare ones have these quote-unquote self-cleaning nozzles. The nozzles are shaped in this weird way. Um, actually, normally there's just a brush sticking up in the airstream, but these ones are down in this little nozzle, and it creates a Venturi effect, which creates more air velocity, which helps to keep this guy clean. So they're kind of self-cleaning or non-clogging. Um, it wouldn't hurt when you do uh, your normal annual filter changes to take a little can of, like, you know, CO2 spray and just blast each one off. It wouldn't hurt to do that, uh, just to keep them clean so they're good again for the next year, but they're pretty low maintenance. The reason people like these is because they are low maintenance. There is no bulb to change. I don't think they work as well as the bulb solutions. And most of the manufacturers, including Respicare, who makes both, doesn't believe they work as well as the bulb-based solutions. But some people don't want to deal with the bulb. Like, ah, I want to change a bulb, and I got paid to come change it. And okay, well, we have this other thing, and this is the other thing. You, as the dealer, you're probably better off with the bulb changes. You want that recurring annual reason to be at their house um, as part of your maintenance agreement or as part of a, of a, you know, a, a fee-based cleaning check, you want to be back there again, uh, as opposed to some of your competitors doing something out there for them. So it's better for you to have the bulb changes, uh, but I can see why someone might want this instead. Like I mentioned, we consolidated three of our vendor, vendors into Respicare. We got rid of three and picked up Respicare because they do lots of stuff. They do our UV lights. They do these cool skinny one-inch filters I talked about. They do the Ultra Clean 99, which is great for guys that are like Heil, day and night dealers, uh, pain, any of those kind of brands that don't have access to the Carrier Bryant stuff. Um, it's great for those guys. They do these um, odor reducers with the carbon cartridges that we talked about. They do the uh, odor miser, which can be the carbon plus, uh, plus PCO. They have the Oxy4 we talked about. They have a few other products that we don't even stock. They have all the test data kind of stuff that we need for their products. I'm not going to go through all of it right now, but each one of these ones, they tell you what it's going to kill, what rate it kills it down to, or inactivates, I should say. And then if you looked at the graph, which are kind of small in this picture, but it tells you how many hours it took to get the space down to those levels. Uh, so they have all that stuff for different bacteria and various viruses and E. coli and some of the chemicals when they break down some of these VOCs. Um, got formaldehyde, which is in a lot of your uh, furniture products that you buy, breaks those things down. Uh, so all that kind of stuff, uh, it actually does, the Oxy4 actually in increases the ability of your filter to catch stuff. Now you don't get a new MERV rating because the filters are tested independent of products, uh, of other products, but if you put a bipolar ionizer or you put an Oxy4 on your system, it will make your filter do a better job because both of those things are gonna clump stuff together to make them bigger and more likely to get stuck in the filter. So if you had a MERV 13 filter, it might behave more like a MERV 14 or 15 if you also had one of these uh, products like an Oxy4 or a bipolar ionizer combined with it. You can't say that MERV rating is different because it's never been tested, but it makes things bigger, which makes it more likely to catch the stuff. I guess technically that wouldn't change the MERV rating, um, but it would catch more of the bad stuff because the bad stuff is bigger, but it would still catch the same size stuff. 
All right, uh, any other questions right now? So I don't see you popping up. All right, let's dive into some of these other things. And some of these may have uh, different levels of interest to you than others. So beyond the stuff we talked about, filtration and various types of air purifiers, what else is part of the IAQ discussion? Some of these are quick and they only need a 10 second discussion. Carbon monoxide alarms, you need to put these in. Every furnace you put in should have a carbon monoxide alarm in the room. Almost every code requires that. Additionally, for homeowners, just so you're aware, if you were doing like a new house or anything you built in the past 20 years, every sleeping quarters has to have a smoke detector in the space and each hallway of the each floor has to have a smoke detector plus the sleeping quarters and then each floor also has to have a carbon monoxide detector so I, in my case um i have a three-story house or two-story house plus a basement i should say so i have in my hallway upstairs a carbon monoxide slash smoke detector combo then the same thing on the first floor and the same thing in the basement and then in each bedroom, there is also a smoke detector with no carbon monoxide. And then in my furnace uh, room closet uh, in the basement, there's another carbon monoxide alarm. We have these Carrier and Bryant ones. If you're interested, they just plug right into an outlet. They're super easy to use. Yes, someone can go to Home Depot and buy the exact same kind of thing uh, off the shelf that doesn't say Carrier on it. And it'd be probably less expensive than buying it from you, right? Uh, and it doesn't need any installation because you plug it in. But if you carry them on your truck and you explain to people and you offer it on the spot and you see they don't have a carbon monoxide alarm, they may just say yes just because it's super easy for them to do that and it's super easy for you to get out of your truck and plug it into the outlet. Okay? So you may do that. Uh, or you can get ones that are more permanently installed like I have in my house. Duck smoke detectors. Unrelated to the codes that require smoke detectors in the bedrooms and on the floors, you might want to put one in the duct. So in commercial buildings above 2000 CFM, duct smoke detection is a requirement. And whenever there's smoke sense in the duct, you have to shut the air handling system off so you don't spread smoke around the building. Makes total sense. There's no code like that residentially, but the same logic would apply. If I have, a, if I have smoke being sucked into my return duct, why would I want my use my supply duct system to send the smoke to all of the rooms so all of my family can get the problem, right? I want to keep the smoke contained to wherever it is. Don't use your duct system to spread the, the, the smoke around, right? And make more people have problems sooner. So we want to shut the furnace fan off. Uh, so I took one of these commercial smoke detectors, which cost you guys, which cost the contractor like 100, 115 bucks, something like that. And I put one of those in my house and it shuts off my system uh, whenever there's smoke detected. This works really well if you have uh, infinity or evolution equipment. Uh, if you wire it the right way, and we have a video on our YouTube channel showing you how to wire it. If you wire it the right way, uh, it'll not only shut the system down, but it'll also send the customer an alarm via email or text message telling them what just happened. We use the ones from System Sensor. We stock those guys. And for residents, you would use the, the one foot or one and a half foot probe. The detectors buy, come by themselves and then you buy a probe that goes the link to the duct. So for commercial, we have all these different links, but for residential, you'd get the small one, which I believe is, I think it's a foot and a half uh, is the one you want to get. Um, other things you want, might want to do, duct sealing could be a factor. We'll talk about that in a second here. Ventilation air is definitely a factor. We talked about that a minute ago. You can do it with an outside air intake, or you can do it with ERVs, or you can do it with an exhaust only system, which is not recommended, but that's possible. Um, it's not, ERVs aren't going to provide you any more fresh air than an outside air intake would. From a health and air quality standpoint, an ERV is no better than an outside air intake, but it's better from an energy standpoint. We'll talk about why that might make sense to you uh, for your projects. Uh, sealing the ducts up. Uh, if your ducts go through uh, crawl spaces, basements, attics, whatever's in those spaces, it's going to suck that air in on the return duct. And that stuff is going to become in your air, right? So if you got some kind of moldy crap going on in your crawl space, right, it's going to be air that gets delivered to your house. If you have fiberglass uh, floating in the air in your attic and insulation, it's going to get sucked in and go into your house and go into your lungs. So sealing your duct tighter has all the comfort and energy benefits that Aerial Seal always talks about but it also has the benefit of better air quality by not sucking crap in that shouldn't be sucked in. And then humidification and dehumidification. Um, I normally just kind of blow those over with like a one slide discussion, but we're gonna talk about it more deeply today because it has a massive impact on the COVID-19, uh, massive. Uh, so we're definitely gonna talk about that. Um, John asks, 
Does duck smoke detectors always on the return duct for flow rate higher than 200 CFM? So for commercial projects, um, there are two different codes that might require the duct smoke detection. There's NFPA, and then which is National Fire Protection Association, uh, and then there's the International Mechanical Code. Each municipality may use one or the other of those. I forget which is which, but one of those codes requires it on the supply. One of those codes requires it on the return. And then if you're in a town that adopts both codes, then you have to do it in both spots. And then both of those codes, by the way, you get to 15,000 CFM, which is pretty big. Both of those codes required on both the supply and the return. Uh, residentially, um, I have mine on my return duct. Um, it doesn't matter a ton whether it's on the return or the supply. The only difference is, I think the logic is, oh, if it's on the supply, then if there's a fire in my furnace cabinet, I'm going to detect that smoke. Okay, I guess, right? If it's in the return side, then I guess maybe it would detect it a little bit sooner um, if you're a fire in your house. But honestly, I don't think it matters that much uh, if it's in the supply or the return. And obviously, the code people don't even agree on. All right, so let's keep on moving here. Oops, on the wrong thing. All right, uh, the International Energy Conservation Code, which is code here in Illinois uh, and most of the surrounding states. You might be on different versions. We're on the 2018 residential in Illinois. Some of the Midwestern states are still, still in 2015, but it's the same for residential. All these things are identical for 2015 or 18 code. They require the duct sealing. They require duct linkage testing to prove your ducts are sealed if they go outside the envelope, attic, crawl space, basement. They require the house to be sealed then they require the house to be lowered or tested to prove it's nice and tight. So with tight ducts and tight tight uh, houses based on these codes and proving that they're tight, which means they really did it, uh, it does kind of change the indoor air quality equation. There's a requirement for load calcs, which is going to affect us. We'll talk about that. There's a requirement for mechanical ventilation because of the house ceiling requirements and because of the blower door testing requirements. The code now requires mechanical ventilation. The energy code requires mechanical ventilation. Uh, residentially. So duct sealing, um, like I said, you have to seal all the ducts, have to be sealed, and then if they go outside the thermal envelope at a crawl space basement, you got to test them, but they all have to be sealed. So anything you've been building in the past few years is getting sealed. But on existing systems, there's nothing wrong with going back and sealing them for the same kind of reasons, energy, comfort, IAQ. Uh, so this is on here just in case you need it, uh, just showing you what has to be done. Uh, if you want to use AeroSeal, that's one way to do it. You can seal stuff by hand. It's just really, really hard to do that and get tight for the code compliance. And then on existing systems, which we don't care about code at that point, but it's really hard to get to all the ductwork to seal it. You might be able to get to the basement ductwork or at least three sides of the ductwork. You probably can't get to the top because it's pushed up against the floor cavity. But then you definitely can't get to the vertical runs because they're behind drywall. So AeroSeal is a nice process. For those that don't know, the way it basically works, uh, the installer goes to each of the one of the, the grills, registers the fusers, pulls the grill off, and puts a foam block in there so no air can come out of those grills. Then we hook up a fan box, cut kind a of hole in the duct, and hook a fan box to it, and we pressurize the duct system. The, so the air we're shoving in there can't go out any of these uh, these uh, terminations because we foamed them off. So where does the air go? If I'm sucking the air in, it has to go somewhere. It goes out of all the little cracks and crevices and leaks out. Then what we do is we inject a... Uh, a vinyl acetate polymer, which is basically like Elmer's glue, uh, school glue, if you will. I shouldn't say Elmer's glue, that's proprietary. It's kind of like school glue. We inject it in an aerosol form in the air, and it travels down the duct system, and the duct system is under high pressure. The space around it is under low pressure, so the air travels out those spaces, and as it does, it changes from low to high pressure, and it allows it to cling on to the edge of the crack. And then basically, each crack gets a little glue ball on it, and another glue ball attaches to him, another one to him, and another one to him, until it eventually scabs over. And then once we pressurize the whole duct system, it can't really move any more air. We stop the process, disconnect our hose, take the foam blocks out, and run the system like normal again. We can get some pretty pretty tight seals that way, uh, down well, well below 50 uh, CFM of leakage after we seal it. Beforehand, I've done, I've done 44 houses in the past seven years, just helping contractors out. And normal starting leakage on the supply alone is typically between 300 and 500 CFM of leakage. On the return, it's more like 500 to 700. In one job, there was 1400 CFM of leakage on the return on a four ton system. It was like all of their air was leaking. There was like no duct. It was horrible. Um, so it, it, they, it's pretty easy to seal this stuff up with AeroSeal 
um, and help us out. All right, humidity. You've seen this chart lots of times, maybe different pictures, maybe different colors, maybe you've seen the carrier one that has like all the weird stuff on it. Um, but this chart has been around since 1985. It's called the Sterling chart, um, or most of us just call it the humidity chart. And it's fantastic because basically it shows you that if things are too dry, bad crap happens. If things are too moist, bad crap happens. Some viruses thrive when it's dry, some thrive, thrive when it's humid, some, some thrive when it's both. Mold and funguses are obviously bad when it's humid. Um, electric static shock is bad when it's dry. Respiratory infections are bad when it's dry, right? All these different things are kind of in that range. The old ASHRAE standard um, for indoor air quality, ASHRAE 62, used to say keep it between 30 and 60%. I'm sorry, the old ASHRAE thermal comfort standard, ASHRAE 55 standard, used to say keep it between 30 and 60%. They dropped the lower end. And now it just says keep it below 60%. It's been that way for like 10 or 12 years. There's no lower end. So most of us just keep using the 30 because we don't know what better number to use. And I imagine after you see the next few slides and after ASHRAE goes through its next code review cycle, you'll probably see the lower end limit show back up again. In any case, for thermal comfort, we recommend keeping it between 30 and 60%. Uh, the ASHRAE IAQ standard, which is ASHRAE 62.1 uh, and 62.2, they recommend keeping it below 65% to reduce mold growth. So for one standard, it says 60%, one says 65. So I just tell everybody to keep it under 60 and you, and you solve both problems, right? Keeping it under 60 is harder than you think, but I wanna show you this. This is uh, a, some test data. Uh, this is from the UK, I believe, but it's on influenza, which I know is not the same as COVID, but it is a small virus nonetheless, and has been shown so far to have similar uh, patterns and reproductive type paths. Uh, this is in Celsius because it's from the UK, so I'm going to put Fahrenheit on the chart here because otherwise I don't know what the hell's going on. I, don't, I can't keep track of Celsius stuff. So on the left-hand side are temperatures. On the bottom side is relative humidity. And then these curves are the risk factors associated with influenza survival. Right? Zero meaning it's not surviving. We're, it's all gone, right? It's all dormant. And then 100% meaning it's all live and active and ready to do something. So if I have, if I keep your space at 86 degrees or higher and below 65% humidity, influenza is not a concern. I don't really want to keep it 86 degrees. That's not very comfortable. So that's not going to work for me. If I keep it down at 77, now I'm getting closer to the comfortable range here. 77 is considered room temp, 25 degrees Celsius. If I'm in the lower humidities, 20 to 35%, I'm at this 60% curve. You have a 60% risk factor, 60% uh, likelihood that I will come in contact with this influenza that, in a harmful form. And then as the humidity gets higher, my risk is gonna go down. I'll be on this black line, 50%. I'm still going, I'm going straight across on this 77 degree line. I'll be at 50%, 40%, what was this, 25%. Over here, maybe about this is 10, so this may be 15% risk factor. Right? And now I'm back up higher again. So my higher risk is when it's below 40% humidity, and my higher risk is when it's above 60% humidity. So high risk, high risk. Now I can get some really low risks by putting it up at 80% humidity on some of these, but then I have the mold problem. So I don't want to do that. So I want to get in this middle sweet spot here. This I'm gonna say between like say between like 40 and 60%. 45 and 55 percent, however tight you want to make it, but that middle sweet spot range is going to be pretty good for getting rid of influenza, and it's going to be pretty good uh, for staying under the mold control number as well. Now, it's, it's no it's no joke that when we get into like October, November, December, we start saying it's flu season, right? Well, that's because that's when we're getting to the point where we start dropping below that 40 percent. When we're in the higher humidity ranges of you know August, September. Influenza is pretty wimpy, right? And then we start getting to like November, December, and it's drier in our buildings. And all of a sudden we're into the, into the flu season over here, right? So if I can artificially adjust your humidity, both adding humidity and removing humidity, I can force this to stay in the sweet spot longer, which means less likelihood of people getting the flu. Let's look at Corona because that's more fun. Uh, now we don't have a lot of COVID-19 data because that's obviously just beginning to be studied. But we have the SARS virus on here on this chart here, which is the closest coronavirus that we know of to COVID-19. 
So that's what I'm gonna use for our example. So I can't promise you that COVID-19 will be the exact same as this answer, but it's the closest answer that anybody has. So the way this chart works is I'm back to that logarithmic scale, up here being 100, meaning 100% 100 uh, activity, right, of, of this guy here. 10% meaning 90% of the viruses are gone and only 10% are left. One meaning 1% 1 are left, 99 are gone. 0.1 meaning 99.9 .9 of them are gone, right? I've inactivated them. Um, so we call this a logarithmic graph because it's not just, it's not linearly scale, right? Um, then going across the bottom axis is how many days it took to inactivate them. The lines are different relative humidities. Uh, in this case, uh, at uh, 20 degrees Celsius, which if I go back and look here, that's 68 degrees, right? So in, like typical indoor type temperatures or, or a little bit cooler than typical indoor temperatures. So if I look at 20% humidity, at 20% humidity, coronaviruses uh, are pretty active, just like they were for influenza. 20%, it's pretty much game on, man. Same thing here. These guys are pretty active. And for me to get down to 90% reduction, which would be 10% left, it takes me two weeks. Two weeks to get rid of SARS um, on its own without it reproducing in a host. Two weeks for it to get rid of it if I have 20% humidity. If I go the other extreme, I go to 80%, it's a much better story, although we have mold problems at 80%, right? But it's a much better story. And for me to get down to a 90% reduction, it still takes five days though. Plus I have the risk of mold growing. So I don't, I don't like that either. The blue line is the 50%. It took me, I'm gonna say one day to get a 90% reduction. It took me two days to get a 99% reduction. It took me three and a half days to get a 99.9% .9 reduction, right? This 50% is definitely doing a lot. If I keep the humidity at 50%, or like I was saying earlier, between 40 and 60, I'm doing a lot to inactivate these viruses on their own. Once again, can't promise COVID-19 is gonna work exactly the same as the SARS coronavirus, but logically, it would seem similar, and many experts are using the comparison because that's the best comparison we have. Here's one more chart for you from that same study. And the study's down at the bottom if you want it. Um, it's uh, from 2010 on that SARS one. Um, same kind of thing logarithmically over here, 10, 110, 1. So that's uh, fully active, 90% reduction, 99, 99.9% .9 reduction. And the bottom axis, this case, is humidity, and we've overlaid three different temperatures. The blue line here is that same 68 degrees we're looking at. So at 20% humidity, coronavirus thrives. 80% humidity, SARS coronavirus thrives. If I get down to 50, I'm at a 90 some, 99 point something percent reduction. And you can kind of see if I keep it between 40, kind of where it's this pinkish color, whatever that orangish, whatever that is. If I keep it between 40 and 60%, I'm down here on a 68 degree temperature. If I keep it between 40 and 60%, I have 99% of the virus not being active, which is awesome, right? If I uh, go the other way a little bit, I go to really cold temps, which you would not do inside your building, but that's the that's what the study happens to have on it. It had, it had two outdoor temps and an indoor temp, but at 39 degrees, it's pretty much valid all the time. Like it doesn't really much matter what I do with humidity, it's really cold. Fortunately, we don't typically cool houses below 68 degrees. Maybe you keep it at 65 or even 60 at night when you're sleeping. So maybe you have a little bit more of a curve like this. We don't keep it down at 40. Go the other extreme, 104, which also would not be inside your house, right? But it's another extreme. Everything kills off pretty quick, right? As soon as I start getting above 25% humidity at 104 degrees, I'm in great shape for inactivating this virus. Now you're not going to keep it at 104, but logically, if I'm looking at this, 68 is kind of cold. If you can keep the house at 73, 75, I keep mine at 77 because I have really good humidity control, then my line is going to be somewhere like right here. If I interpolate. Right? So if I can keep the space temperature in the mid 70s and keep the humidity between 40 and 60, I'm going to do a pretty good job at inactivating a lot of this, uh, a lot of these viruses. Uh, I mentioned that the uh, COVID-19 was similar to SARS. This one's from the University of Illinois, my alma mater. Yay, good shout out for those guys. Uh, COVID-19, SARS, and MERS all fall under the coronavirus category, and there's a few others as well. Influenza does not, it is different, uh, but it does have some similar traits. Um, we don't have time to go into this into detail, and I'm also not a medical expert to do that, 
Um, but when they were showing us this chart on one of our uh, alumni uh, webinars, uh, it was for the purpose of explaining to us how COVID-19 has very similar behaviors to SARS. Um, so it's there if you want it. It's obviously not been as contagious, it's been more contagious as SARS, but not as, not as deadly. Um, but it has similar reproductive patterns and so forth. Uh, so get this, how do we get the humidity in check? Uh, on the low end, we add humidifiers. I'm not gonna beat that to death. You know how to do that. You've been doing that in this industry for a very, very long time. You know how to add humidifiers to people's systems. Um, and obviously we have the Carrier and Bryant ones. Uh, we have Honeywell, we have all, all the brands you would expect to have. And I'm not gonna even dive into that today. You know how to do that. So adding humidification, especially when the fall season comes back around, when you start doing September and you're doing your cleaning checks, Adding humidification for the purpose of virus control is now a thing, right? So April Air, Honeywell, Bryant, Carrier, um, all these brands we can help you with. On the dehumidification side is probably where you guys need more help. Uh, step one to dehumidifying is to stop oversizing equipment. If you're interested, we have a whole one hour webinar recorded uh, from like a month or two ago called Supersize Me that goes into all the gory detail on the oversizing issues with dehumidification. And ironically, I did that right before I knew about it had its effects on coronavirus, so I didn't include that discussion. But if I did it again, I would include that. There's so many other bad things with oversizing and dehumid for de dehumidification. From a code standpoint, you're required to do a load calc. It's not optional. This is this is 2018 code. It's the same in the 15. It's the same in the 2012 version. So whatever state you're in, you're required to do a manual J load calc. You're also required to use the weather data for your area. Right? And ACA publishes weather tables for that. You don't have to use ACA. You can use somebody else's weather data, but you have to use somebody's. So you can use ACA, ASHRAE, NIOSH, but you can't make up your own weather data. And then indoors, you have to design for 72 and 75. You are not allowed to legally design someone's house to cool down to 72 degrees or 73 degrees or whatever. 75 is the coldest cooling temperature you can design for. The fact that money you guys are designing it to get down to 70, 72, 73, is part of this oversizing problem, which is part of the dehumidification problem. If you look at Illinois, and we have the charts for all of these in Emmanuel J if you need them. I don't look at O'Hare. My design temp for heating is minus one, even though many of you think it's minus 10, it is nowhere near that. Um, and then for cooling, it's 88 degrees on the 1% column, which is all we look at on residential. 88 degrees for O'Hare Airport. Uh, I live in Aurora, it's 91 degrees for me. Nowhere on this chart is at 95. Well, maybe St. Louis, we're St. Louis. St. Louis is 93. Even in St. Louis, it's not 95, right? Many of you guys designed for minus 10, 95, because that's what your grandpa did in 1962, literally. Uh, stop doing that. 88 is my design temp for O'Hare, or midway 91. So somewhere between 88 and 91 for your manual J calcs is what your outdoor temp should be. Stop inflating it. We don't spend hardly any time at those extremes anyway. Yeah, I realize that tomorrow it's going to be like 92 degrees or whatever. Even today, it's supposed to be 92 degrees, I think. And that's a, a rare occurrence, and we have way more than enough safety factor in the equipment anyway to be able to handle that. Think about how many jobs you've had where it's been 98 degrees at somebody's house, and they still had enough cooling, right? Think of polar vortex day. I designed my house, or designed my system for my house, rather, uh, for my Aurora. Uh, I used the ASHRAE data, which was minus four, I think. This one's minus one, but I used minus four for my house in Aurora. Polar vortex day last year, where it was minus 26. Guess whose furnace kept up just fine? And I took 100,000 BTU out and put a 60,000 in, and it still kept up. I could take it out and put a 40 in, and it would still keep up. This is how badly oversized systems are. Um, so there's plenty of safety factor in there. But getting this right size cooling system is step one on dehumidifying well, right? Step two on dehumidifying well is getting more than multiple stages. One stage sucks. You should stop offering people one stage cooling. One stage cooling is for people that rent. If you got someone who has a rental property and they do not give a crap about comfort because they don't live there themselves, that's who you give the one stage stuff to. Anybody living there, entry level should be two stage cooling. Entry level, and you should try to talk them out of that. Five stage cooling, variable speed inverter, that turned down to 25% is phenomenal. Uh, I have it at my house. It's been fantastic for dehumidification control. I have it in all of our labs and I play with it and test stuff on there all the time. I have one right now with dehumidifying one of my labs um, it's fantastic. Um, more stages, more better. So get the right size equipment, then get lots of stages. Don't get a lot of stages and use that as a reason to not get the right size equipment. Cause then you spend all your time at stage one or two and you don't get any turndown ability because your system's oversized. You have to downsize it or rather right size it, 
then also get the staging. Uh, you could also choose different evaporator coils. Some of the evaporator coils have better latent performance. Typically, with the ones we call super coils do better. You can look at that if you wanted to for some slight improvement. Variable speed or multi-speed indoor fan control does wonders for dehumidification. You slow the air down. It spends more time in contact with the evaporator coil. We pour more moisture out of it because we have a lower dew point, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so variable speed indoor fans do wonders. Uh, your thermostat control. Um, Obviously, Evolution, Infinity, Ion Controls all have fantastic dehumidification functions that slow the blower down and change the staging to dehumidify more and change the sensible heat ratio. But even if you don't have a cool system like that, just having an Ecobee stat or a Venstar stat that has dehum control or a Honeywell that has dehum control. Uh, and those stats, you can have a, you can turn on a feature. Ecobee calls it uh, uh, AC Overcool Max. You can turn that feature on in the install setup until three degrees max. And then you can go into the into the settings of the stat until you want to maintain 54% humidity. And when it gets above 54% humidity, I put 54 because I think it has a 5% hysteresis, so it kicks on at 59, which keeps me below the 60 that I was talking about before. Uh, so I set it for 54, so it kicks on at 59 and runs down to 54. Um, but it'll kick that on and overcool by as much as three degrees. That allows me to keep my indoor temperature higher most of the time. So instead of setting my stat for 72, I can set it for 75, and only on really humid days would it subcool me. And if I go back to those numbers, like keeping it at 75 instead of 72 is better for coronavirus spread. Keeping the humidity below 60 is better for coronavirus spread. There's a lot of logic to that. Beyond just the regular comfort for people, there's a lot of logic in regards to the uh, viruses spread. All right. Last thing we want to we want to squeeze in here is the fresh air options. I put this at the end because it's kind of lengthy because uh, there's a lot going on here. Uh, and I didn't know if we'd get time to get to it or not get to it, but it looks like we did. So um, we're going to talk about ERVs and we're going to talk about fresh air intake systems. Um, and we'll talk about exhaust systems as well, even though I don't want you to do exhaust systems. I'm going to power through a couple of these slides in the interest of time. Uh, just know that having fresh air dilutes down whatever's going on in the space and improves the air quality. Because generally speaking, the indoor air quality is worse than the outdoor air quality, unless you live next to some kind of like oil refinery building or something weird like that. Other than that, outside air is better than inside air. So you want to bring outside air in to dilute the inside air down, right? And the more outside air I bring in, the more inside air gets pushed out of the building, hence the pollutants go with it. There's lots of studies that relate these ventilation rates to people's be uh, benefits with asthma and other types of things like that. I'm going to skip those. They're on there if you need them on the slides so you can see them, but I don't have time to do it today. So why do we need the ventilation? Um, first of all, we need to bring supply air ventilation and because some of the things in our house are sucking air out. Um, if you have 80% furnaces and boilers, they are putting your house under a negative because they're sucking air from the room and exhausting it out. So I need to have air coming back in for those. Some of the local codes, like I know over in Naperville, the next town over from me, they require you on 80% furnaces to bring an outside air intake duct, I believe within three feet of the furnace, I believe it is. Um, no, maybe it's 12 inches, I don't remember. But they, you have to bring it all the way over by the furnace. Uh, and then, of course, if you have a 90% furnace or boiler, then you can pipe an intake with PVC pipe and take care of that problem. But other stuff, other gas appliances, uh, stoves, ovens, uh, water heaters, dryers, stuff like that are also um, sucking air out. You need to make that back up. Now, that combustion air makeup needs to happen for some of these things like furnaces and boilers, independent of the outside air intake ventilation code. Um, however, uh, things like your dryer and stove, which are very seldomly operated relative to your furnace and boiler, those ones typically don't require their own intake. Uh, then you also have other stuff that's sucking air out, like your bathroom exhausts and your kitchen hood are sucking air out. We need to make that air up as well. So there's some makeup air components to the ventilation requirement in addition to the dilution component that I need. The energy code, once again, um, in Illinois and most surrounding states, because uh, this has been in there since 2000. And 12, so it's in the 12, 15, and 18 versions, requires you to have mechanical ventilation systems. Because they made the code have the houses be tighter, they also added the requirement for mechanical ventilation. I know that sounds stupid. Hey, make everything really tight, then go punch a hole in the wall and suck air in from outside. What the hell? It's more about control, because if I can control the hole it's coming in, I can heat it, cool it, filter it, and deal with it that way, uh, versus letting it leak in wherever I want, which causes more issues from a comfort standpoint, which causes bad thermostat setup. So there is an energy saving benefit to bringing the air in through a controlled opening versus non-controlled. Um, you're required to have an ECM motor if you're going to bring the air through the furnace. That's no longer a discussion because FUR made that mandatory anyway. 
And then if you're going to use an ERV for ventilation, um, there is a requirement that you get down to 1.2 CFM per watt, which is pretty tough to get to. Um, so some of the ERVs will make it at certain airflows, but the same model ERV might not make it at another airflow. So you have to be, if you're going to comply with code, you got to be smart about how you choose your ERVs and HRVs. And we can help you with that stuff. Uh, this is the ventilation rates required for Illinois. For you guys that are in other states, um, you're probably following either the IMC, the IRC, or ASHRAE 62.2 for residential. All of those have the same basic mathematical formula for determining how much ventilation you need. The Illinois code has the same formula as well. They also just happen to put it in a table because they know that we don't like formulas in math. So therefore, I'm using this one because it has a nice table. But your ventilation rate is probably really, really close to this uh, in your state. So the way this chart works is you look at your square footage and the number of bedrooms. Why the number of bedrooms? Because the number of bedrooms indicates how many people there likely are that are living there. The first bedroom counts as two people, and after that, it's one person. Um, so this already counts for that. So you, you're looking at this, if I look at a 2,000 CFM or 2,000 square foot house with three bedrooms, I need 60 CFM. If I have four bedrooms, I need 75. If the house is a little bigger, they say 3,500, then I need 75 for a three bedroom, 90 for a four bedroom. And the chart goes on and on from there. That's how much CFM you have to bring in if it's continuous, meaning the ventilation operates 24 seven nonstop. If you don't wanna operate it 24 seven nonstop, let's say you only wanna run it half an hour each hour. Look down here for 50% run time, you got to double all the numbers in the chart. So, so the 60 becomes 120, the 90 that I mentioned becomes 180. That's a lot. If you only want to run it 15 minutes out of the hour, you got to quadruple it. So 60 becomes 240 CFM, 90 becomes 360 CFM. Do not do that. Your furnace is not rated for that much outside air. You can do a mixed air cut on your furnace and see, but I don't know if I have it on here somewhere. Somewhere I do. Uh, we'll find it eventually. But I think it's, uh, you can't be below 60 degree entering air to the heat exchanger section of the furnace for an 80 or 90% furnace. Because both of them have a non-ferrous, both of them have a ferrous heat exchanger uh, on them. A, a, a one that's susceptible to corrosion. So if the air is too cold, it'll cause condensation on the heat exchanger and rot it out. So your warranty is voided on your carrier or whatever brand furnace if you drop below 60 degree inlet temperature to the heat exchanger. And if you have a lot of outside air mixing with your return air, it's pretty easy to get up below 60. If you're just doing this 60 CFM or this 90 that I talked about, you're probably going to be fine and running it nonstop. But if you start putting on some kind of timer, you're going to be hosed. So be really cautious about putting it on a timer. Um, there are three ways to get the cold required ventilation air into the building. You can go negative pressure, which means you run your bath and kitchen fans all the time. And you probably install an extra exhaust fan as well. Or you put bigger bath fans in and run them all the time nonstop. And you constantly put the house under a negative, which means the fresh air leaks into the walls. We don't like that because on humid days, it means moisture gets driven into the wall assembly, which is not good. But that is allowed from a ventilation standpoint for code compliance. Not super smart from a humidity standpoint. You can go to positive ventilation, which is what most people do. You bring outside air duct into this return of your furnace. And whenever your furnace runs, it delivers air to the space. Now, you can put dampers on there. And both Honeywell, um, actually Honeywell, April Air, Carrier, Brian, all have these types of motorized controls that you can put on there. But now you're into this realm of running it some fraction of the hour, which means the CFM goes up, which means you void your warranty on the equipment. So if you're putting these dampers in for code compliance reasons, you're probably doing it wrong. Instead of putting a four inch duct, or excuse me, instead of putting an eight inch duct with a damper on it and running it intermittently, you can put a smaller damper, a smaller duct on here with no damper and just have, have the fan run all the time uh, and compile the code that way. My house was built in 2002, and that's how mine was built. I have a wild duct coming in with no dampers. That's it. The last method is a balanced ventilation system, which typically means I'm going to have an ERV. It means I have supply fans sucking in, I have exhaust fans sucking out, and if you're going to buy both of those kinds of fans, you might as well run them through an ERV. The exhaust only, like I said, it's bad news. You're putting the house under a negative, which means whatever is outside is getting sucked into your walls. That means dirt's coming in, pollen's coming in, humidity's coming in. I would not recommend you do this. The only people that think this is a good idea are manufacturers of bathroom exhaust fans that don't make any other equipment. Those people are like, yeah, you should do it. We have all these cool controls and everything, blah, blah, blah. It's a bad idea. Everyone will tell you it's a bad idea. This slide is stolen from the guys at CDAC, which is uh, the University of Illinois' uh, 
Energy Center that does a lot of the code training for the state of Illinois, those guys are not excited about this either, right? I stole their slide. They're not excited about it. They just tell you it's one way to do it, but it's a horrible way. But it's cheap. You do have to put exhaust fans in anyway for code. So that's why it's cheap. You're already putting an exhaust fan in. Well, could you put some bigger exhaust fans in? That's kind of the logic with some of these guys when they're bidding these jobs. And we have all those bath exhaust fans. If you want to do it, we can get you Brone exhaust fans and other ones that, and do the job for you. We just don't like it this way. Supply only, like I mentioned, we can definitely do that. You do not need to have this damper. Or you might want a manual damper, like they're showing here, for balancing purposes. You don't need the automated one. They're showing here on the left. Uh, in fact, there's never, if you're doing it right, there's never a time you would shut it. So why do you need this at all? Uh, but this will put the house under positive pressure slightly, which means anything that's in the house will be driven outward. And usually the stuff in the house is better conditioned, temperature and humidity wise, than the stuff outside. So this is probably the preferred way to do it. Um, and you don't have to run it to your return duct on your furnace. You can set, separately duct it within its own fan, but why bother? You already got a furnace fan with supply duct just ducted into there. If you do want to put the dampers on there, you can do that. We have the ones from Honeywell Carrier and Honeywell, uh, Honeywell Carrier, Bryant, and April Air to do that if you want to. Oh, there's a number there. Um, 60 degrees, uh, and intermittently you could drop down to 55 degrees, mixed air temp coming in of your outside and return mix. So you can use that along with your temperatures on a zero degree day to figure out if you're gonna have a problem. And if you're gonna run this thing less than 30 minutes out of the hour, you're probably gonna have a problem. It's just easier just to size it for the full airflow. And then there's balanced, which is the ERV discussion we're talking about, right? So I have air that is leaving the house and exhausting out and air that's coming in. There are different ways to duct this. This run right here from CDAC, this is the right way to do it. You do not buy bath fans. You don't have them at all. Your ERV becomes your bath fan. And the fresh air comes in and you save energy that way. Because this bathroom air is leaving, either way, it's leaving my house. So I might as well save the energy from it and recover that energy. If you duct it any way other than this, it's going to be energy wasteful in, compared to doing nothing. An ERV will cost you more money if you duct it wrong than if you did nothing. And I'll show you that. Um, we have all the brands ERVs. I probably should have also threw up the Renew Air and S&P lines uh, on here. I didn't think about that because the slide was a little bit older when I grabbed it. Um, but we added those, I don't know, five or eight years ago. So we have S&P, we have Renew Air, we have Life Breath, Carrier, Bryant, Honeywell, ERVs. We have all of those, residentially speaking, to help you with this type of stuff when you want to do it. All kinds of different shapes, sizes, CFMs, fan options, everything. We can find the right one for you. How is this basically going to work? You know, let me show you the winter example first. A seven degree day outside air comes in i have 72 degree return slash exhaust air leaving this building so i'm going to take that heat and use it to run it through plates the plates don't actually touch each other but i'm going to use that heat to warm up a metal plate or other type of material and the outside air is going to come in and pick up that heat so my seven degrees is going to become 53 degrees before it enters my uh, furnace system summertime it works exactly the same way but in reverse in this case, the heat is all in the outside air. This is a really extreme 95 degree day with a 78 degree nasty wet bulb. That comes in and he's gonna deposit his heat and his moisture in there. And then when the exhaust air leaves the building, he's gonna pick it up and take it with him, which in return is gonna cool my air from 95 down to 81 and dehumidify it from 78 down to 68. The ERV is gonna pre-cool and pre-dehumidify my air before it gets to my furnace cabin, right? And same thing in the winter, but the opposite. He's gonna preheat it and pre-humidify it, I went from six to 40 wet bulb, right? All for the price of moving the air, the fan energy. So the three ways you can duct it, you can get it in ERV and duct it standalone fashion. What does that mean? That means it has nothing to do with your furnace, nothing to do with your regular duct system. You have a four duct system. You have a supply and return for your furnace, you have a supply and return for your ERV. We're not showing the furnace on this particular drawing, right? In that case, you wanna take all the air from the bad areas, typically means bathrooms, and if you need a little bit more, you take it from a hallway. And then you supply all the air to the living spaces, which typically means bedrooms and living room. All right? So you can do that. Problem is you're buying four ducts. Well, you're buying actually buying six because you also have the exhaust and supply to the exterior of the building. Then you have the supply and return for the ERV. And then you have your regular furnace duct system. But throughout the whole entire house, you would have four ducts, which is cost prohibitive. This is the worst way to do it. But this is how every HVAC contractor does it. So it's the worst way. You're literally better off not buying an ERV. In this case, they're pulling some of the return air out, 
running it through the ERV and then bringing fresh air in and picking up that heating energy and putting it back in return. Sounds logical, right? The problem is you're taking return air out and throwing it away for no reason whatsoever. Even if you got a really good ERV that was able to recover 65 or 70% of the energy, even 75% of the energy, top of the line residential ERV, you're recovering 75% of the energy on air you could have just kept and had 100% of the energy by keeping it. Because in this scenario, you still have to put all your bath fans in and run them. So your exhaust air is still leaving somewhere else. So this air you're taking out here is air you did not need to take out. There was no reason to take it out whatsoever. You only took it out to run it through your ERV because you need something to duct to the ERV. It's so stupid. Do not duct this way ever. With that being said, the ERV we have in our Melrose lab is ducted that way. Why is it ducted that way? Well, it was installed before I was in the training department. So I didn't really know what was going on. Uh, it needs to be redone. We just put one in in the, in the Aurora lab and we did not duct it that way. We ducted the Aurora lab this way. So this is kind of like the SEAC way, right? But in this case here on the SEAC way, I would still have my regular furnace providing the supply air and return air, so a four duct system. This is kind of like a combo of that. This is a three duct system. I like this one a lot. Now, if, if it's not new construction, it's gonna be hard to do this, usually, unless it's gut rehab. But in this case, I have a three duct system running throughout the house. So I have my returns from the bedrooms and living rooms going into my furnace like normal. Then in the bathrooms, I did not buy exhaust fans. And instead, I ducted the exhaust system into the ERV to recover that energy and then exhausted it out of the building. So instead of exhausting it locally out the wall and losing the energy, I exhausted all the bathrooms through the ERV and kept the energy. Now, we're all showing the kitchen on here, but this is not the kitchen range hood. Over here is the kitchen range hood. That needs to go out separately because the grease needs to leave. I just needed somewhere other than the bathroom to pick up air because the, the bathroom wasn't enough CFM for me. So we pick it up in the kitchen dining area of the kitchen, the general area of the kitchen. So it can remove some of those odors. If you prefer, you can also put it in the general hallway. So that stuff leaves throughout the ERV and gives us its energy. The fresh intake air comes in it picks up that energy and that dumps into the return of the furnace. So then I only have one supply duct going out. So I have two return systems, one for exhausts, one for actual reusable return. And then I have one supply system bringing the fresh air and the return air mixture back to everybody. So a three duct system. That's the best compromise on how to do it. You don't have to buy buy it bath fans, you save money there. You buy one less duct system instead of four, like most people recommend, you'd only buy three. This is a beautiful way to do it. I apologize for all these drawings being different. I should, it'd be great if I had one drawing and I just kept changing the lines on it, but I stole all these different drawings from different people. Um, Cause I am not a good artist, so I steal. Uh, that's why they all look a little bit different. Then you got the choice of an ERV or HRV, and we'll kind of wrap up with this here. Um, for our climate, usually I'm gonna recommend you put an ERV in. Why an ERV? Well, because an ERV, if you recall, is gonna help me with temperature and humidity in the summer, keep my temperature and humidity incoming to be lower, and in the winter, keep my temperature, humidity, and temperature, blah, temperature and humidity incoming up. It's gonna help me with those things. So it's gonna preserve my heat and humidity in the winter, and it's gonna prevent the heat and humidity from coming in in the summer. And the ERV is usually the way to go. Sometimes when you get too far into cold climates, it becomes problematic because it frosts up too much and you have to have too many defrost type cycles. So you might wanna go with an HRV in those cases. Each manufacturer is gonna tell you where in the country you should use each of their kind of products, HRV or ERV. This is the map that we use for Carrier and Bryant. And the new air map is at, and S&P map is very similar, uh, as is the Honeywell map. Uh, the life breath map is very different. So if you're looking at life breath, then you're in a different category. Um, so usually we're not using life breath in our climate because they, their technology historically has not been well for ERVs in Chicago. But everybody else with a map like this, we're in the blue area, that's ERV all day, baby. And the orange area is the kind of debatable area, and then red is HRV. So we are definitely in the ERV category in Chicago. Uh, Milwaukee, Indiana. Uh, so you guys in those areas, even Minneapolis, the guys that are in Minneapolis that logged in today, uh, you're still ERV territory. You're kind of on the border, depending on how you want to look at it. Um, guys in Kansas City that logged in, you're definitely ERV territory. Oh, I did have one last thing for you. Uh, if you want, uh, there's this device called Air Advice. Um, anybody can can buy these, but the Carrier and Bryant guys have some kind of special deal set up on it, I believe, with the factory. Um, you take this into someone's house, you you 
plug it into an outlet and let it sit there for 30 minutes and then it talks through a cellular wireless card and it automatically emails you the service tech or the sales comfort advisor a report about the air quality of that person's home and if you want you can leave it there longer to get more data and trend graphs and all that stuff but 30 minutes is the minimum to get something this is a snapshot of what it looks like i put it in my house uh, a couple years back just to play with it um, but it tells you the particular account that you have in your house and if a particular account is high it's going to recommend you do different kinds of filtration and stuff like that and duct cleaning and those kind of things it looks at the voc count and gives you solutions for that right it tells you you might want to use a pco device right or more fresh air it looks at the temperature it looks at the humidity um, it looks at a few other things as well like co2 and stuff like that but those are the big ones particulates vocs temperature and humidity Somebody asked me yesterday, I think it was, if it can measure viruses, bacteria, and mold. No, it can't. And I don't know anybody's portable device that measures bacteria and viruses. You can get mold test kits. Um, it takes several days to do those test kits. You can get those. Uh, they're not electronic. They're typically uh, a petri dish you set, up, set out on a counter or something. But that's available. But there's nothing for you to in-home test viruses and mold. Uh, in addition to giving you the report, and then if you let it run longer, giving you graphs of the same information over time, uh, it'll also give you recommendations on things you might want to do. This one happened to be from the carrier branded version of the Air Advice, so it gave me carrier recommendations. If you didn't have a carrier or a Bryant one, you had a generic life or generic Air Advice, then it would give you generic solution options here and would not brand them. But it tells you what to do in some of these cases: bring more fresh air in, add a humidifier, yeah, use UV light. There was one for PCO devices you saw earlier: it's carbon monoxide alarms. Oh, it measures carbon monoxide too. I forgot that. It does that one as well. All right, I thought I was going to be under the time, and once again, I went over, as I always, always do. Um, this last thing here, anybody who wants this, just send me a note. Actually, I'll just send it to all of you. Uh, I'll send it to all of you so you have it. It's a chart we've been working on here in the office. Like I said, uh, Sal and John in the office have been helping build it. Um, actually, I think Sal did most of the lip work, and then John and I just contributed. In any case, the way we got it laid out right now is there's some filtration options on here. Uh, you guys can see this, right? Yeah. There's some filtration options on here. The entry level is MERV 13. Like I said before, there's no reason to talk about anything less than that. And actually, less than that is pretty generic commodity anyway. So there's some MERV 13 options on here. Then there's a couple MERV 13s that have ionizers built into them, like that one inch Respicare I was telling you about, the Microfin 95. Oops, it's 95. Uh, and then an April Air one as well. April Air one's nice because it goes up to MERV 16. So those are on there. And we have an air purifier section which are the three that I told you about, Secure Air, uh, Bryant of Aleutian Carrier Infinity, and then the Respicare Carrier 99, and what they can do. Then some of the duct-mounted air purifiers, like PCO devices, Oxy-4, bipolar ionizer technology, just a generic UV light by itself without anything else. And there's some, uh, some standalone portable type units that we've added on here recently. Then for each one of these guys, it tells you what it's going to be able to do, right? Is it going to be able to remove certain kinds of particulates from the air? Right, so obviously all the filters have the ability to do some of that, but only some of those filters can remove the really tiny things. Secure air is the only one that can remove stuff from the space air. These other guys, these guys have to wait for stuff to get to them. Secure air will bring the stuff back, right? The Respicare is not actually doing the filter, the Oxy-4, not actually doing the filtering, but it does that um, clumping of particles to make the regular filter get it. So that's why we got check marks on that guy, because it'll make your regular filter. Like if you can bind this guy with that guy, and he's going to have the ability to get those these particles back to your filter for you, right? Uh, what they have the ability to do in terms of killing viruses, mold, and bacteria. Um, some of these regular filters, yeah, they can capture mold, and some of them can actually capture um, bacteria, but they're not going to be able to uh, to get the viruses. They're too small. Uh, but some of these other ones can do the viruses. And if they can do something to help out with odors, which some of these devices can help with odors, what kind of warranties they have, power consumption. You see a couple with question marks. I got to find the answers and fill those out, but I'll eventually hunt those answers down. What the pressure drop range is for the different sizes. There's a range because there's more than one size, one of them, one model number. Um, so there's some pressure drop ranges on here. These are all pretty low pressure devices that are on here. And what typical filter change cycles are. So I'm going to send it to all of you just so you have it. Um, and then we're going to keep updating it as we do a little more research on each one of these guys. Any other questions from anybody? I think I got them all. There was not a lot of questions today. I'll give it a second here. All right, I'm going to take that as a no.
So thank you guys for your time. Uh, I did record this. So if you have a coworker that needs or wants to see it, uh, it'll be up on our website by the end of the day. All right. Thank you for your time. Appreciate it.